Okay. Yeah. Uh, just kind of fresh. To we're, uh, we're opening up the wall there so that those of you who are standing, there's another 130 seats or so in the theater area, and you're welcome to uh, occupy them. And we'll get started in a few minutes. Okay, we're going to start in a couple of minutes, so if we uh, could have everybody find a seat, and we'll get going.
Good evening, everyone. Uh, before we get started, before we turn the TV cameras on, uh, just to give you a little bit of an overview of what we're going to do tonight. My name is Aaron Kirsten. I'm the Executive Director of the Flamborough Chamber of Commerce, and I'll be your moderator this evening. Uh, after the um, speakers have given their brief introductory comments, somewhere in the neighborhood of five minutes each or so, we will open the floor to comments and questions from the audience. And we're going to do that in that corner over there. Jason, why didn't you, can you stand up a second there? That is uh, Jason Small. Jason is the pastor of the community church here in Flamborough, and he is the uh, president of the board of directors of the Flamborough Chamber of Commerce. We may be the only chamber in all of Canada that has a pastor as a chair of the board, but uh, that makes us different in Flamborough. Jason, Jason, uh, the format that we will use once we get past the presentations is um, we invite you to take up to two minutes, a maximum of two minutes, to either share a comment or uh, ask a question. Um, and uh, you may direct it at any one of the panelists or just make a comment in general. And um, if it's directed at a particular member of the panel, we will uh, ask that panelist to answer that question, but the other panelists was all, will also have an opportunity to, uh, uh, to respond. And uh, we invite you to line up against that wall if you want to participate in that way, and we'll just see how it goes. 45 minutes or so for the presentations, and then an hour or hour and 15 minutes or whatever. Uh, we'll uh, take your questions and your comments. Okay, I think that's it, James, in terms of introductory. Good evening and welcome to Waterdown District High School, where tonight the city of Hamilton is hosting a information session about the possibility of hosting a casino in the new city of Hamilton. My name is Aaron Kirsten. I am the executive director of the Flamborough Chamber of Commerce. And I need to be very clear from the beginning that this is not a chamber meeting. Uh, this is a city of Hamilton meeting. And um, for better or worse, they have asked me to be the moderator. And in a moment of temporary insanity, I agreed. S sometimes, you know, um, participatory democracy, because that's what this is. It's an exercise in participatory democracy. It gets a little bit messy, but you know what? It's way better than anything else. And I'm hoping that you'll work with us in uh, creating a positive and constructive meetings where we do two things, where we listen and where we learn. And that we can give some direction to council as it struggles, wrestles with the issue about whether or not Hamilton should be a willing host for a new casino under a restructured Ontario Lottery and Gaming Corporation. We're going to start this evening by uh, asking our panelists to uh, speak for a few minutes in terms of their area of expertise and their perspective. And after that, we will invite um, you to come forward and to ask your questions or make a comment. Uh, but before we do that, and to recognize some of our special guests tonight, I'd like to invite uh, Councillor Judy Partridge, Ward 14, Ward 15, Ward 15, uh, to say a few words. Thanks very much, Aaron. And yes, I guess it was a, a lapse in judgment. This is Ward 15. I am Councillor Judy Partridge from Ward 15, Flamborough. But I do want to recognize Councillor Robert Pasuda, who is also here joining us this evening from Ward 14, which is the other side of Flamborough. Thank you, Robert. And uh, Robert and I are hosting this evening's meeting, and I just wanted to say welcome. Thank you for coming. I am delighted to see such a turnout here this evening. I am joined also by some other uh, councillors, and I'd ask them to stand up and be recognized. Councillor Chad Collins. Thank you, Chad. Councillor Sam Marula. Thank you, Sam. Councillor Terry Whitehead. And Councillor Scott Duvall. And I very much appreciate their support in coming here this evening. There will be another forum on tomorrow evening. It will be at City Hall. It will be reasonably the same format. It will be facilitated by our city manager, Chris Murray. Please stand up, Chris. 
and, uh, and the same uh, panelists will be joining there. It was very important when we were look at, looking at structuring these forums that they be duplicates so that regardless of which forum you attended, you're receiving the same information. So you will be able, and you're going to hear a lot of information this evening, which is a good thing. So you can keep that in mind. We're also here to hear the same information so that when we're making up our minds, and I will tell you, my mind's made up, it's got to be Flamborough, it has to stay there, and it must be the slots and racetrack and casino operation. Thank you. So that's easy for me to say because I am committed to that and I've been committed to that from day one. So thank you again. Thank you to all the panelists for being here this evening. Greatly appreciate it. And for all of you, please do take the opportunity to ask the questions. If you're not able to line up and ask the questions, we will have cards for you to write down. Mike, is that right? Okay, so we do have cards that will be handed out. We want to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to make your comments known and to ask your questions so that we can get back to you. Before I leave the podium, I just want to say thank you so very much to the staff that organized this meeting. I want to recognize Norm Schillen. Where's Norm? Norm? He's here somewhere. And Mike Herkopoulos, who's here. And also Allison Morrison from my office. Allison does an amazing job. And uh, we're very, very grateful to have her. So thanks very much, everyone. Enjoy your evening. <laughs> And because this is Flamborough, and because we have another councillor from Flamborough, and that's Robert Pesuda, if you wanted to say a few words. Thanks, Aaron, and I don't have a whole lot to say. I'm here the same as the rest of you. I'm not sitting with my colleagues, not that I'm special or different, but my wife is here and she's here as a citizen of Flamborough too. We're sitting together to listen to the, to the uh, presenters and listen to your questions so I can take this back. I do sit on the uh, gaming subcommittee along with Councillor Partridge, Councillor Marula, Councillor Whitehead, and the Mayor, so I do sit on that, but we're, we're interested in hearing what you're saying. Um, real quick, like I said, following in through, and particularly for me, and being a farmer, and we have the Flamborough Downs and the horse racing there, it, it's near and dear to my heart to preserve the horse racing and keep the slots there, or should it be a casino be there? We need to keep that there, and I'm going to fight to the end for that. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm sure that the representative from the OLG will explain this in greater detail, but in, in uh, Reader's Digest version, uh, the OLG is undergoing a modernization, and as part of that process, uh, two things are required. One, that municipalities must decide whether they're willing hosts in any one of 29 different zones across the province, and second, there must be public consultation. Uh, Many municipalities have decided to do this in different ways. Uh, we're, uh, I think what the City of Hamilton doing is, is much more aggressive. Uh, it's not just a come and go meeting. It's, it's not just uh, receiving letters or petitions. It is actually going out to the community and asking people for their opinions. And that's what tonight's all about. You must also understand that the City of Hamilton has not yet adopted an official position. The City of Hamilton, this is part of the process, and I think the Council will agree with me. They're waiting to hear what you have to say. They have to make a decision by the end of February 1st of March deadline, and that's what tonight's is all about. The other thing I think that I need to share with you is that the City is committed to um, conducting a scientific poll uh, that once, uh, uh, as, as the clock keeps ticking, they're going to go to the community and conduct a scientific poll as a further indication in terms of what the people of this community think. All right. Um, as I said, we have, um, we have seven panelists. These have been chosen by the city. All of them have agreed to take time out of their busy schedules and to share some thoughts and perspectives with you. And um, we're going to start with Tony Bitonti. Tony is the Senior Manager, Community and Media Relations for the OLG, the Ontario Lottery and Gaming 
Corporation. Tony. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, everyone. And uh, on behalf of the Ontario Lottery and Gaming Corporation, we want to thank the City of Hamilton and the folks of Flamborough for inviting us here and giving us the opportunity to uh, explain uh, a, a very complex um, modernization and transition that our corporation is undergoing and, and why we're doing it and how it will impact all of you. You've been able to play the lottery since 1975. You're all familiar with Winterio, Lotto 649, Lotto Max. Casinos have been around the province since 1998 when Casino Windsor, now Caesars Windsor, opened its doors. Our modernization right now is focused on improving customer experience, expanding jobs in the gaming industry and the lottery industry, and increasing the public money that goes really to you, to the people of Ontario. To do this, we're doing three things. First, we're becoming more customer focused. Uh, this means that OLG will be where our customers want us to be, and we'll be providing them the games and the products that customers want to play. Second, we're expanding the regulated private sector delivery of lottery and gaming. And really what this means is that we've identified areas of our business that where it makes sense that these qualified private sector service providers will be involved instead of the government. That's really what the involvement of the private sector really does mean. And finally, OLG is renewing its role in the oversight of lottery and gaming. This means we're looking for ways to be even more efficient and focused on, on rather important priorities for us, one of them being responsible gambling. So really, what are these, these three tenants? What, are this, what does this mean to you and to your community? Hamilton is currently one of 24 communities that hosts a gaming facility in this province, and you're all familiar with the slots of Flamborough Downs. And I just want to mention that OLG has a great relationship with the owners of the racetrack, Great Canadian Gaming, and the gentleman right beside me, Bruce Barber, um, we work very closely with him and, and his folks, and we're very proud of that relationship, and we will continue with that relationship. The new OLG, though, will have qualified service providers running the day-to-day -day operations of our gaming facilities with OLG over, overseeing them, really overseeing the management of that operation. And in order to get these service providers to be interested to put up the money to run our facilities, uh, maintain them, and possibly even expand them, we have to give them options. And that's why we created uh, what you're hearing of these gaming zones that surround our existing facilities. These are areas where there is the potential to relocate gaming facilities. This is the option that we have to give to the private sector. Uh, the zone that we're in is known as SW9, and it encompasses Flamborough and Hamilton. And whichever company gets the rights to operate gaming in this area, they'll examine the commercial viability of the existing site, of the slots of Flamborough. They will take over that slot facility um, that where we are currently leasing space at the track. And then they'll decide whether it will be financially beneficial to relocate into Hamilton's core, and possibly at a convention center or hotel or other amenities that make it more than just a casino, or they can keep it right where it is and develop it there. These are the options that they're facing. So it's not a, a, a fait accompli that this is going to move. This is the option that the private sector operator will have once they get the right to operate gaming in this zone. Since the slots of Flamborough opened in October of 2000, the City of Hamilton has received almost $52 million from its share of the slots revenues, and that's based on 800 slot machines. There are over 220 employees, and OLG has paid them over $134 million in benefits and wages, and that is very substantial because that money remains here in your community. We've purchased more than $34 million from local and regional vendors, and we've sponsored local events to the tune of $525,000, and that's various festivals, music festivals, uh, chamber breakfasts, mayor's breakfasts, what have you. Uh, we, are, we feel that we are a good community and corporate partner uh, for the city of Hamilton and for the area of Flamborough. So you may be wondering how a new gaming facility in the city of Hamilton could benefit the community. 
If a gaming site is built within Hamilton's core, the private sector operator has the discretion of building a new facility with up to 1,200 slots or less, depending on their business case. We've given them some parameters, and we just don't want them to exceed those parameters, but they will decide what they feel is best for this area. Again, this number is based on our business model that helps us determine the optimal number of slots to put in any given area uh, due to customer demand. Uh, there's also the possibility of table games. That will be determined by, by the, the company that, ha that takes over the rights to operate in this area. A relocated facility in the core of Hamilton has the potential to increase gaming revenues, which would le lead to increased municipal commissions and a lot more economic activity. When we're talking about increased revenue, a relocated facility would be larger than the one currently at Flamborough and could grow current revenues by, uh, we're estimating, about 5% or more, depending on the private sector and their investment, the number of table games, and as I mentioned, the number of amenities, whether there is a convention center, hotel, restaurant, whatever the development may be. The potential range of revenue for the municipality will be between five and seven million dollars per year. Currently, Hamilton gets uh, about four million dollars per year from the slots of Flamborough. Tax assessment is another, is another benefit to the city. That assessment on the new amenities could be between one and three million dollars a year. The investment opportunity uh, in the hundreds of millions of dollars. New construction with the amenities could be anywhere between 100 and $200 million. And again, that's private capital investment. Ontario Lottery and Gaming Corporation and the government of Ontario are not building casinos. They're not building slot facilities anymore. This is why we want the private sector to do this. They can do it much more efficiently. They can upgrade these facilities. Because if we look at the facilities that we have right now, uh, being our gaming facilities and our lottery infrastructure, um, we would have to invest over a billion dollars to upgrade these facilities. These, are, these facilities are used 24-7. Our lottery terminals run every day. And if we ask the government to help have us spend one billion dollars to upgrade these facilities, we know what the answer would be. It would be no. And where would the money come from? It would come from our bottom line. And that bottom line really does go to the province of Ontario for health care, for education, on average, we give about $2 billion a year to the province of Ontario. $1.5 billion goes to the operation of hospitals. $500 million is dispersed amongst responsible gambling initiatives for amateur sports, for education. $120 million goes to the Ontario Trillium Foundation, which I know is a big benefactor for this community as well, too. And again, so that's 100 to $200 million in potential capital investment for a new facility. And then we're looking at increased jobs. Gaining jobs uh, would go from four to 600, and that is not including the jobs that are associated with a convention center or a hotel. Those, again, would be up to the private sector to decide how many jobs are there, but that would be an increase as well, too. I mentioned earlier that we're renewing OLG's role in the oversight of, of lottery and gaming. This means that increased oversight and responsible gambling. Problem gambling, and this is what we, we say all the time, we're not hiding from this. It affects a small population, small percentage of our population, on average 3.4%. And we're fortunate in Ontario to have a vast and strong structure for responsible gambling. 40 million goes to the Ministry of Health for research, prevention and treatment. And that 40 million comes from a, rev from a share of the slot's revenue. 14 million is from OLG's internal budget. We have a statutory, regulatory, and policy mandate to address problem gambling. And when the private sector takes over these facilities, the responsible gambling responsibility is not going to be a nice to have. It's going to be a must have. We're going to, they're going to be audited by us and by third parties. And they will be checked on this stuff. So this is not something, again, that we're going to slough off to the private sector. This is something that will be there, will be increased, and there will be strong oversight. And that's our responsibility as the OLG. Over the long term, the industry model that we have for Gambling Ontario will succeed from a business perspective and from a responsible gambling perspective if we broaden our player base. We can't rely on a small portion of players for our revenue. And that's a big myth around here. 
We seek regular and casual players who spend you know, a small portion of their entertainment, of their disposable income, gambling in a healthy way over a long term. We need to understand how to help players to choose to gamble so that they don't get into trouble. This support makes them better customers, and we want it to result in, in healthier play habits. For those who may develop a problem, we ensure that there are supports in place, like free counseling in every community where, the, where a casino exists, uh, and there's a longer list that we'll address a little later on this evening. And we're very grateful, oh, she's very grateful for the strong working relationships we've developed and the collaborations that have helped us to design and deliver our RG programs. Like CAMH, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, they, uh, they train all of our staff on our gaming floors to spot warning signs. And the Responsible Gambling Council, they have responsible gambling resource centers in every one of our facilities. OLG has been directed by the government to deliver a gold standard for responsible gaming, gambling. And this is what we will do, and this is what we will demand of our private sector operators. There's a lot more of what I can say in the five minutes, and I think the time is ticking down very quickly. Uh, but for more information, uh, I ask you to look to our website, modernolg.ca. There's a lot of this information. It expands on what I've said. And also what's there are testimonials, videos from mayors of our host communities, chiefs of police from our host communities, chambers of commerce, and various other stakeholders that have been involved in us. Right now, we have 24 living case studies of what casinos and slot facilities do to communities. Please take a look at Modern OLG, and we'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank, Thank you, you Tony. Okay, our next speaker is uh, Bruce Barber. Uh, Bruce is from the great Canadian gaming company. He's the executive director of horse racing operations at Flamborough Downs, currently at Flamborough Downs and of course is the landlord, if I say it right, for the OLGs at Flamborough Downs. Bruce Huron, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I too would like to thank the City of Hamilton for giving me the opportunity uh, to speak a little bit about Great Canadian, but primarily to talk about horse racing, um, where it fits in this community and the effect um, of horse racing on the community, and quite frankly, the very, in my opinion, positive effect. Um, at Great, Great Canadian um, is the largest uh, Canadian gaming company. Uh, we're publicly traded. Uh, we own 17 properties spread over three provinces in one state. We have properties in um, Nova Scotia, Ontario, uh, British Columbia, and Washington State. And these range from small community casinos um, in towns like Dawson Creek to our uh, flagship casino, which is in Richmond, B.C., which is called River Rock, as well, and which, which is re really critical um, for our discussions here tonight. We're also the largest uh, racetrack company in Canada. We, own, we currently own four racetracks in Canada. To give you an idea of the scope of the company, uh, we do about a billion dollars a year in annual gaming revenues. Now, and with the majority of that uh, revenue going to the provinces that, that we reside in, um, we also have a billion dollars capital invested across the, our businesses, including the Flambros uh, and Georgians of the world. Um, we have a very strong balance sheet, and we're po poised for growth and are prepared to grow um, here in Flambro and Hamilton. Um, on the racing side of the business, just to give you an idea of, of, uh, of our background, the, we own three standard bred tracks, one in, in British Columbia, Fraser Downs, two here in Ontario, Georgian Downs and Flamer Downs, as well as a thoroughbred track in British Columbia. Um, we, in, here in Ontario, we have invested over $210 million in our facilities, and that includes upfront capital as well as improvements over, over the last number of years. Um, on the racing side of the business, at Flamber Downs and Georgian Downs, we actually account for almost 10% of the total uh, racing revenue in the province. Um, and if you take the big uh, woodbine out of the uh, equation for the signature tracks, etc., it's a much more important portion of the business for, the, for racing than just 10%, if you will. Uh, Flamborough, to give you an idea, for, and I'm assuming most have been to Flamborough, seen Flamborough, 
Um, Flamborough is a multifaceted outlet. Uh, we have, um, as, to as Tony said, we have 800 slot machines at Flamborough. Of course, we have standard bread racetrack. We have dining options. We have four different dining rooms. We have meeting rooms. Uh, we run three OTBs, off-track betting, one at the track um, on days that we're not late racing live, plus two more in the community, one in um, Stony Creek and the other in Burlington. Um, and at Flamborough, Flamborough itself, we've invested over $100 million. So we're very uh, invested uh, in Flamborough Downs. Uh, Flamborough Downs currently races 188 days of standard bread racing live, plus we're, we're open virtually every day for simulcast racing. The actual handle at Flamborough, as I mentioned earlier, um, between our two Ontario tracks is close to $100 million. It's actually $67 million at Flamborough. And of that, live handle is $31 million. So uh, a very key racetrack, not only for us, for Great Canadian, but for the horse people in the province of Ontario. So all of that sounds nice, and, but what does it mean? What does it mean to Hamilton? Um, and what does it mean to horse racing here in Ontario? Um, Flamborough Downs uh, slot revenue to the, to the city of Hamilton is approximately $4.6 million. We also pay just under a million dollars, eight, over $800,000 in municipal taxes to the city of Hamilton. Um, as well, we purchase over $5 million in local goods. Uh, salaries at uh, the OLG and uh, Flamborough uh, amount to over $16 million a year. When I say the OLG and Flamborough, it's our employees and the employees that are employed by the OLG. Um, one, of, one of the things that I think gets lost sometimes is the horses and the horse people. Um, there are over $16 million in purse money made available to local horse people coming out of Flamborough Downs on a yearly basis. And over 66% of that stays locally. The catchment area for Flamborough Downs is Flamborough Downs, if you will. Most of the horses racing at Flamborough um, come from this area, and that purse money goes out to uh, horse people here in, in the Flamborough area. As well, on the job side of it, um, there's another, uh, we've talked about the, OL, or I've talked about the OLG jobs and the Flamborough jobs. There's also another approximately 250 jobs uh, on any race day with people in the paddock, um, people like paddock judges, uh, ORC judges, veterinarians, etc. cetera. Um, so when you look at that, what does that mean um, totally? Totally, there's direct, direct input into this, na into this community of over $36 million on a yearly basis comes out of Flamborough Downs and our horse racing community. Um, and on the jobs, on the jobs side of that, um, as, as, we, as the OLG began their modernization process, uh, the, you'll hear the term SARP, S-A-R-P, which is the Slots at Racetrack program. That program was canceled uh, effective March 31st. Um, and with that, um, the revenue that, go, that, that went with that revenue sharing uh, between uh, the OLG and Flamber Downs and the Horsemen. Um, uh, uh, Ted McMeekin, Minister of Agriculture, um, back in May or June, formed a panel made up of three former cabinet ministers. We call it the OMAFRA panel to look at this, um, at what's happening in a way to ensure that racing can can continue to grow and thrive in not just in Flamborough but in in the province of Ontario, um, as they've looked at that, one of the discussions has been around jobs and the economic impact beyond the uh, 650 jobs, direct jobs that we know are at Flamborough Downs. The panel talked about how many jobs, uh, from an economic standpoint, from a spin-off, if you will, were in this in the province of Ontario, and although they, they even say in their report they struggled with um, how many jobs were created by, by racing, but on a conservative note, they did say they believe that at a minimum there was 30,000 full-time jobs. 
Flamberdown's race is 12% of all of the racing here in the province of Ontario on the standard bread, uh, uh, overall racing, sorry. Um, and that relates, if, if the panel's number of 30,000 uh, really does mean that there's 3,600 more jobs in this area caused by racing. So it really makes the job impact of Flambro Downs and the horse people and the horsemen here of 4,200 jobs in this area. Uh, directly and indirectly related to Flamborough. Can I ask you to wrap it up, Bruce? Oh, okay. Um, just on that then, uh, I just wanted to make sure that everyone's aware that Flamborough Downs and Great Canadian Gaming is committed to horse racing at Flamborough Downs, uh, but I also wanted to make sure everyone's aware that uh, coming out of the AMAFRA report, they very clearly stated that there's no jurisdiction in the world that has world-class horse racing without government support. And that's what the panel's looking to do. But to be sure so that everybody is aware, if there is no support for um, horse racing coming out of the panel or the Ontario government, uh, horse racing will cease to exist, not only at Flamborough Downs at the end of March, but likely in all of Ontario. We know, we know that racing will be significantly smaller than it is right now. But for racing to survive at Flamborough Downs, we do, we do require the funds that would come from the government and the MAFRA. And with that... Thank you very much, Bruce. Our next speaker is um, Deputy Chief Ken Leanders, or if you are from the country where I was born, you would say Leindertse, or something like that, close. Uh, uh, close. Um, and Deputy Chief Lenders is going to share some reflections and thoughts from the policing perspective. Deputy Chief. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ken Leanders. I've been a Deputy Chief for nine years and a police officer here in Hamilton for the last 33. Um, from a policing point of view, we understand that there are concerns uh, that a casino will increase crime in a neighborhood, will become the impetus for organized crime to flourish, or will increase gang activity. However, from all the review and statistical information, as well as academic research, it appears that this does not bear out. It appears that the fear of crime is much greater than crime itself. Now, in a 2012 study done by the University of Nevada reviewing the effects of, of a casino on crime, it shows that casinos might increase the total volume of crime in an area, but there will be an insignificant effect on the overall crime rate. Casinos are seen to have the impact similar to very large recreation or tourism draws, similar to uh, a, a park or, or a fair. There is an increase in enforcement that may be required to handle increase in crime, but the probabilities of becoming a victim will likely remain the same. From our work with Flamborough Downs, the Hamilton Police Service has seen approximately 758 calls for service in that location for the last six years. Now, although the Hamilton police do not police the inside of the casino, we are responsible for all the activities outside the casino. Based on our records, the top five calls for service at Flamborough Downs are stolen autos, are trespassing, theft, intoxicated persons, and impaired drivers. We have also reviewed policing activities at our neighboring communities, which include Fallsview and Niagara Casinos, as well as Woodbine Casinos in Toronto and found that there has been no significant impact with the increase of crime in these areas. The Niagara experience shows that the typical calls for service are again thefts, motor vehicle collisions, domestics, mischiefs, disturbances, and intoxicated persons. The inside of the Ontario casinos are policed by the OPP in conjunction with OLG. They are responsible for all calls for service within the casino as well as gathering intelligence and preventing cheats at play. Casinos are highly regulated and have numerous safeguards to protect against organized crime, which includes background checks of all employees and owners. As for our increase in criminal activity outside the casino environment, there is no data that shows that there would be an increase in domestics, fraud, or other criminal activities that can actually be tied to the activities of a casino. From a Hamilton perspective, from a policing point of view, the Hamilton Police Service is committed to policing in this city to ensure the safety of the people and their property. It is not our position in law to comment on either support or reject the position of a casino within the city of Hamilton. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. 
Kill it. There we go. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is our next speaker is Paul Burns. Paul Burns is the vice president of the Canadian Gaming Association. Paul, you're on. Thank you. Uh, can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, the Canadian Gaming Association represents major operators and suppliers in Canada's gaming industry. Uh, we primarily sponsor research to speak out on nas important national and regional issues. Um, we're a trade association for the industry. There is a lot of misinformation that often surrounds debates on casinos. And we applaud the city and especially the Gaming Facility Proposal Subcommittee for initiating this process. These are uh, excellent and healthy processes. It's been designed for pride information so people can come to inform decisions, and we welcome that. Uh, off the top, it's probably no surprise, but we do support the OLG's modernization initiative in bringing the private sector's expertise and experience to gaming in Ontario. And we have seen that gaming in Canada is a significant part of Canada's entertainment industry. It's, a, it's an economic driver that has, uh, generates thousands and thousands, over 100,000 jobs across the country. Good paying jobs with the average salary here in Ontario being about $50,000 a year in our industry. We've had almost two decades of experience with gaming and casino gaming in Ontario communities large and small to look at. And that's a point I want to make and I think everybody should remember. It's been a substantive and positive experience creating thousands of well-paying jobs, generating hundreds of millions of dollars in economic development, billions of dollars in revenue for the province and for municipalities. So the question tonight really isn't should casino gaming be allowed in the greater Hamilton area because that's kind of been asked and answered. It's been here. It's been here for over a decade. Um, we've seen facilities not only here but in Brantford, Mohawk Raceway, Falls View Casino in Niagara, short distances away for this community. What's really under consideration now is how best to work together with the OLG, the Ontario government, to realize entertainment development that will be profitable for the community and sustainable over the long term. It's about where the best gaming facility can be located, what are the components, horse racing, hotel, convention, these are things that will be decided in the, by an operator and, and the community together. That per, that best serve as drivers of positive act activities to increase tourism, create linkages with economic development, greater utilization for local suppliers and service providers. So the City of Hamilton has set out a process to determine what's in Hamilton's best interest. And we welcome that. I'm happy to answer your questions here tonight. There are a lot of myths and concerns around gaming. Deputy Chief just spoke to one about crime. And there are others around the rates of problem gambling and social costs and other things like that. And I'm happy to answer the questions uh, with you tonight. So I turn it over to the chairman and I look forward to the questions. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. Our next speaker is Mr. Robert Murray. Uh, Mr. Murray, Robert is manager of problem gambling for the uh, Center for Addictions and Mental Health. Robert. Thank you and thank you for inviting me to participate in this important community event. We really do believe that any expansion of gambling in Ontario should be preceded and informed by this kind of community consultation. This is fantastic. First, let me tell you a little bit about the organization I represent. The Problem Gambling Institute of Ontario, and I'll refer to it as the PGIO, is a program of the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health, otherwise known as CAMH. CAMH is the largest addiction and mental health hospital in Canada, a teaching hospital fully affiliated with the University of Toronto. The PGIO has the largest specialized gambling treatment program in Ontario. We provide training and support to Ontario's specialized problem gambling treatment system. You may know that there's about 52 agencies across the province that are given funding to provide treatment for problem gambling. And we work with a broad range of allied professional groups. We have an interactive website, problemgambling.ca, that in part provides online support for people with gambling problems and family members. We're also committed to the development of evidence-based solutions to gambling-related problems through research. As part of our role to reduce the harms association, associated with problem gambling, we have 
also been providing responsible gambling consultation and training to the OLG uh, and other industry groups since 2005. We recognize that gambling is a social reality. But the issue that this community and many other communities need to deal with is what's the right balance here? What's the right balance between providing access to gambling, uh, generating revenue for municipalities and governments on the one hand, and concern for the public health of our citizens on the other? I should state at the outset that the primary concern of my organization is for the public health of the citizens. We believe that government policies should put a priority on public health concerns over the goal of generating revenue. <laughs> Gambling is a really big business in Ontario and readily available. In southern Ontario, 93% of residents are within a one-hour drive of a casino or a slot machine facility. For Hamilton residents, the amount of time drops to 40 minutes for a casino and 25 minutes for a slot machine facility. Ontario has the most electronic gaming machines, gaming tables, and lottery ticket terminals and game, games in Canada. In fact, total government gaming revenue in Ontario outpaces all other provinces by a wide margin. It should be understood that the plan for gambling expansion that we're talking about just doesn't include the casinos. We can talk about that later. But it has other elements to it that in combination has the goal of increasing net revenues by $1.3 billion. That's a B. Decreasing average player age from 55 to 53. So the industry is looking at lowering the age of participants. Increasing player partition, participation rates from 70 to 75% all this by 2017. It's a, it's a very ambitious plan to expand gam gambling. Now our next speaker will talk about the considerable evidence that gambling has a negative, negative impact on health, um, on individuals, on communities, so I won't go there. And I think she'll talk a little bit about prevalence too, but just note that up to currently, up to 331,000 people, adults in Ontario, have a moderate to severe gambling problem, more than the populations of Burlington and Cambridge combined. And here's an important thing to consider. It's estimated that between 30 and 40 percent of Ontario's game, gambling revenues come from people with a gambling problem. Therefore, you should keep in mind that about a third of casino revenues from a Hamilton venue, should it be built, would come from people struggling with gambling problems. When you also think about the absolute number of people who are affected by problem gambling, the 330,000, multiply that by 10, because that's the number of people who are also affected by the individual with a gambling problem. Gambling as a social and health issue is relatively new compared to other concerns like problems with alcohol or drug abuse. A lot of people do have a really difficult time understanding why people get into trouble with it. And I'd like to spend a couple of moments addressing that. We know that certain groups are particularly at risk for gambling problems. These groups include people with a family history of addictions and mental health problems. By the way, 50% of us will have a mental health or addiction problem in our lifetime. People with pre-existing emotional and mental health problems people with histories of trauma or abuse, a particular concern for women, people who are susceptible to boredom, who have poor impulse control. That would include people with attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, for example. Social isolation and lack of support is another factor. It should also be understood that a lot of people just don't understand how gambling works. There's a lot of myths and cognitive distortions that can, be, that can fuel a problem with gambling. Belief in luck, belief in systems, belief in talismans like troll dolls are common. Many, believe, many believe, believe in what is referred to as the gambling fallacy. The more you lose, the more likely you're going to win. Sorry. 
all of this indicates that people don't understand a fundamental element of gambling. That's randomness. I'm going to talk a little bit about slot machines in particular because they're the most problematic. Why would people develop a problem with slot machines? Speed of play and continuous nature of slot machine play is a big factor. Players on modern video slot machines can complete a game in as little as three seconds. There is virtually no, no pause between plays and virtually no opportunity to process what has happened. The intermittent nature of reinforcement of rewards that are involved with activities like slot machine play are also powerful in getting people to do something and keeping them do it. Slot machines also feature near wins that actually don't represent the real outcome of the play. It's a complicated bit of business here. We've got what's called virtual reels, a mechanism that really doesn't, you know, you, you think you've got a, a cherry and a cherry and that cherry is just below it, the line, looks like a near win, it's not. You're still, you, you lost big, but it doesn't look like that. Multi-line slot machines that are now standard in the gambling industry also present losses disguised as wins. In other words, the machine will go off with lights and sounds even though you win less than you bet. So all of these structural characteristics of slot machines can lead people to develop serious problems with gambling. In addition, the sensory effects of the games and the casino environment, the lights, the sounds, the colors, stimulate certain parts of the brain and can lead many people to a dissociative state that some people call the gambling zone. This can impair judgment and can be especially addictive for people looking for an escape. Again, our next feature, we're just, for lack of time, I won't go into it, we'll talk about the, the, the possibilities that we have to mitigate harm, the measures that we can take should a casino here in a Hamilton be built, whatever. It should be understood, though, that those measures will only reduce the negative impacts to a certain degree. And actually, there is no agreement uh, necessarily on the part of the industry that those measures will be taken. So again, thank you for, um, for inviting me, and I'm glad to talk to you afterwards when we do our Q&A. Thank you very much. Um, two things before we get to Dr. Richardson that I want to share with you. For those of you who are a little reticent to get behind a microphone and speak, we will be handing out cards for those who want to submit written questions and Councillor Partridge will collect them and uh, will formulate the question from, from the, the input and will ask the question that way. I also want to uh, recognize um, the arrival of two more members of Hamilton City Council. Uh, Councillor Bernie Morelli and Councillor Tom Jackson. Welcome very much. Uh, I think if I count there, I go down the list, that's six Hamilton councillors out of eight. And it's just tremendous to see so many of them come up, uh, come up the hill to Flamborough and visit with us. Thank you very much, sincerely. All right, uh, our next speaker is uh, our very own Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Elizabeth Richardson. Dr. Richardson. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here this evening and just for those of you who don't know, I'm, Toronto, I'm uh, sorry, I'm Hamilton's, oh my goodness, uh, Medical Officer of Health. And uh, I've been Medical Officer of Health since 1998. We, of course, run the uh, public health services and programs for um, the city of Hamilton. And we also run a problem gambling treatment program through our alcohol, drug, and gambling services within the city. The, um, the information I'm going to present to you tonight is based on a lot of work done by Toronto, and that's why that name came to light. Um, they had a, a study that was commissioned um, with the uh, Center for Addiction and Mental Health and did a lot of work on analyzing some data on an Ontario-wide basis. There's been a lot of, um, of studies that have been done in this area. There's still a lot of uncertainty when it comes to research um, in this area, as you've heard from some of the speakers, but that's also why you'll see some different opinions coming through depending on where the information has come from. So, 
when we look at gambling, gam gambling occurs across a whole spectrum. There's people who don't gamble at all, of course. There's people who gamble infrequently, and there's people who gamble more so. And some of those people get into problems with gambling. And when we're talking about problem gambling, we're talking about a, a continuous or periodic loss of control over that gambling behavior. Um, a preoccupation with gambling or thinking about the money that they want to get for gambling and really some irrational thinking and continuing on with this despite some the adverse consequences that occur. And I'll talk more about those in a, in a minute. Why is public health interested in gambling? Um, you know, traditionally that hadn't been one of our programs and services. We had taken over a treatment program when that uh, began some years ago. But largely it's because of the expansion in gambling that's happened worldwide over the last 30 years, not just here in Ontario, but elsewhere as well. And so there's an increased number of people who are participating in gambling, and with that comes an increased absolute number of people who have problem gambling problems. And so when we look at the health and social impacts of that, that's why public health is interested in the issue. As uh, Mr. Murray just said, there's also the, um, the impact that goes beyond the individuals themselves, but onto their, their family members and onto the community as well in terms of problem gambling. From a public health perspective, we step back and we take a, a broad view of things. What are the health and social and economic um, impacts, positive and negative, associated with any particular activity? We're in, interested in promoting informed attitudes, and that's why forums such as this are so important for making decisions such as these, and as well balanced policies um, when it comes to any public health issue, in, including gambling. We think it's really important healthy behavior. Of the 66% of Ontarians and likely a similar amount of, of Hamiltonians that participate in gambling, by far for most that's a leisure activity that they have a good time at. But for some it is not. We want to promote people to staying in that healthy spectrum and help people from moving down that risk continuum to becoming problem gamblers. And for those that do, we want to get them the help to move back out of that zone and to, um, to minimize the impacts of those harms on their life and the lives around them. The overall prevalence, is, as Robert said, I would talk about of problem gambling has been mentioned before. Within Ontario, it's somewhere between 1.2 and 3.4 percent. So that for Hamilton, that's about 5,000 people are currently affected by problem gambling um, at a minimum and up to maybe 17,000 people. A further 3 percent are at risk, so another 15,000 people are at risk of problem gambling. And about 18 percent of people from the survey data that's been done most recently have um, shown some signs that, that may indicate problem gambling is an issue for them. They've spent more than they wanted to, and about 4% have tried to win back their losses, which we know um, doesn't happen. Um, you know, it's already been mentioned in terms of the gambling revenues, about 36% of gambling re revenue comes from problem gamblers, and it, that also depends on the type of gambling they're participating in. It's higher for certain types. So overall, it's clear if we increase the participation rates, at least on an absolute numbers basis, if that problem gambling rate stays the same, the absolute number of people who have issues with problem gambling will increase. So Robert's already gone over the um, factors that increase the risk of problem gambling at the individual level and as well at the environmental level. And I'll just perhaps round up with a few more of those. So at an individual level, um, youth are at higher risk, older adults, males, people with financial challenges, people on low incomes, and particularly for them because they tend to gamble a higher percentage of their income than people who are at higher income levels, uh, people who experience early wins. There's also those environmental factors which make problem gambling more likely to occur. If there's greater access to gambling, the participation rates increase. So that can be availability in your community. That can also encompass the whole idea of proximity. So the closer it is, studies have shown, that you're more likely to gamble if that casino or that center is closer to you than if it's further away. The type of gaming, as has, as has been described, is also important. So electronic gaming machines, slot machines, VLTs, those sorts of things carry a, carry a higher risk of problem gambling than do other forms of play. And that's really borne out in the data that we look at. We looked at from Connex, which is the problem gambling hotline, and from our own data where we see the among our problem gamblers that we work with, slots are the major issue. Um, that's not to say there aren't people who have problems with lotteries and other forms of gambling, but those are, that is the top issue. 
We also know that operating uh, policies do tend to influence whether problem gambling occurs. If you're ta we're talking about maintaining responsible gambling practices, it's important to have the cues and the supports to maintain those. So things like operating hours and having a break from play. Things like having a clock so you can gauge how much time you've been um, playing at, uh, at the tables for or at the slots. Bet size, um, access to money on the floor, all those things. So I'll come back to those a little bit more in a minute. In terms of overall health impacts, problem gambling is, so, is associated with a number of mental health issues. Depression, anxiety, um, ADD or, or attention deficit disorder has also been talked about tonight, personality disorders. Overall, problem gambling, problem gambler's sense of well-being is less so than other people's. About 76% of non-problem gamblers say they feel mentally well and only about 35% of problem gamblers. One of the most troubling things is around suicide. About 37.9% of problem gamblers say they experience suicidal thoughts, and of those, and about 20.5% of problem gamblers have made a suicide attempt. And that's higher in youth who are problem gamblers. And yes, there are youth under the age of 18 who are also problem gamblers. There's an association as well with substance abuse, and the numbers vary here on this as well, but anywhere from a 20 to 60% codependence, as we call it, or having both a, a problem gambling problem as well as a nicotine or tobacco problem and an alcohol or other substance abuse issue. Generally, problem gamblers just don't feel as well. Um, you know, similar sorts of ideas. They tend to have um, more health complaints, more problems with colds and flu, fatigue, stress related symptoms, headaches, those sorts of things. And in part that may be because they spend a lot of time in, in gambling activities rather than spending it in other leisure activities such as exercise um, or in other healthy eating habits and, and uh, sleep habits and those sorts of things. So that may explain that. Family-wise, um, there are impacts as we've heard about. There's financial impacts um, on the individual when it comes to problem gambling and those can extend to their family, whether it's a periodic inability to you know, make the rent this month or whether it becomes more of a financial crisis when they've spent their life savings or um, you know, have to declare bankruptcy and those sorts of things. And you can see how those can impact further on the family and the relationships within the family. The stress that can come to those relationships um, as people try to hide um, or get into issues of debt and fraud and the breakdown and divorce in relationships that can then uh, ensue. From a community perspective, there has been described an increase in alcohol and fatigue related traffic accidents associated um, with problem gambling. Employment impacts around lateness, absenteeism, illness, theft, those sorts of issues have also been described and of course the overall bankruptcy impacts. I did just want to come back to that issue of youth. It's something that's near and dear to our hearts within public health services is, is uh, the youth in the community and there is a, a problem gambling program that's operated by the Y in Hamilton as it is in many other places. Um, youth these days are growing up with more exposure than ever to legalized gambling. And we're not quite sure what that's going to mean. We know their problem gambling rates are probably about the same as others, maybe a little higher from the, some studies. But this issue of the increased suicide rate among youth and the fact that many problem gamblers talk about how their problem gambling started in youth is a concern for us going forward. So we recommended that um, in our report that went to the Board of Health on December 3rd and then on to the, the, the uh, gaming subcommittee that a public health approach be taken to gambling. So again, that's looking at the issue broadly, um, considering how we can help people who um, choose to uh, engage in gambling to maintain healthy practices, looking at ways we can help to reduce harms for those who have gone down the, the spectrum and help to protect as well vulnerable populations who are at higher risk. So there's a number of approaches there, and one of those as well is public policy approaches. And one of the most promising things um, by many research, that many researchers have found, although there's still research to be done on it, is operating policies such as limiting casino hours, not having ATM machines on the floor, limiting alcohol on the floor, um, implementing a mandatory player card system so the data can be collected to look at at gambling patterns and so that individuals can receive back information on their gambling habits and how that compares to others who are, uh, who are gambling. And um, a few other uh, policies are there as well. Important to us as well is that the research continue. 
on all the aspects of gambling, but also on this gambling expansion um, as it goes forward. And not, as Robert has said, just around the casino issue, but at the broader expansion um, in activities in bingo halls, internet-based gambling, and those sorts of things, so that we can look at and make informed decisions as a, as a society and as this community about where we want to go with this in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Richard. Our final speaker on the uh, panel, um, we have, uh, you had no so forth that uh, Professor Hannah Holmes would be um, speaking on some of the economic impacts of um, uh, gambling in, in our community. Uh, Professor Holmes is unable to be here tonight. She will be joining uh, those of you who attend tomorrow night's meeting at City Hall, also at 6.30. But on very short notice, we were um, fortunate and thankful that we were able to recruit Dr. Atif Kabursi. He is a professor of economics at McMaster University. He has a PhD in economics and statistics and has been with the McMaster Department of Economics since 1969. Dr. Kabursi. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm the last speaker and I feel like the last husband of Elizabeth Taylor. There, there isn't much new I could bring to the arrangement, but I'll try. Uh, let me say right at the outset, there is nothing healthier than debating this issue with informed people, with experts, but also in an inclusive community participation. And there is really good room and there is good reason to debate this, uh, because the issues are complex, but also uh, the whole framing of the issue uh, needs to be deconstructed. We tend to exaggerate the economic benefits, and I'm guilty of it. I wrote the report for the horse racing, uh, the 30,000 numbers I estimated. I've done hundreds of these studies. Mr. Burns knows that I was involved in these things because it's easy and very simple and straightforward to estimate the economic benefits. Their systems, their models, their uh, uh, calculating uh, machines almost programmed to do this in very simple terms. The social impacts are real, just as real, but very hard and difficult to estimate. But there is no question here, the issue about gambling is not about the positive economic impacts. They're there, they're large, but the real issue is about net economic impacts. And this is really the issue is to subtract, to take charges against these positive impacts, trying to evaluate and estimate uh, what are these costs. And there are many. Let me begin with the first one. The money that people tend to spend on gambling represents redirected expenditures. There were studies, lots of them. In Wisconsin, for example, they found out through a very well-established evidence-based research that 10% of the money spent on gambling was spent on groceries. That about 24% that was spent on gambling was spent on clothing. That about 34% that was spent on gambling was typically saved and represents a drawdown. But at the same time, they found out that 40% of the people would have spent this money on some place elsewhere where gambling exists. So the story is a bit mixed, but nonetheless, one ought to recognize that there is a cannibalization here. The people in the horse racing industry understand this, that horse racing was the only gambling activity, and when the casinos came, uh, the horse racing industry uh, suffered major uh, catastrophic results and had to be somehow shored up by bringing in slot machines. So the cannibalization problem is a real and substantive one to take account. Then there are also the issues that we have to take uh, account of some of the problem gambling. Things. And the issue here is, yes, 90% of the people gamble uh, without any problem, but then there are this small strata, small subset of people who tend to develop problems, and they tend to really represent a very large proportion of the revenues of these gambling activities. And the issue is, to what extent can we pair the social cost and the problems that these people bring about 
not only to themselves and their families. They say that not only 10 times. Some of the estimates I've seen, Goodman and others, who have really said that for every problem gambler, there are about 17 people other than the problem gambler that are affected from the employers, from the people in the neighborhood, from the health system, from the policing system, from the social uh, welfare system, from the health system. So there are a number of issues here uh, that you need to factor in and price into this equation so that these positive impacts that we talk about are made more realistic and made more representative of the underlying situation so that we do not exaggerate the economic benefits but have a very proper and balanced view uh, of this. There are also the issues of uh, uh, talking about the other negative things. Uh, the deputy chief was absolutely right that uh, if you look at the host communities in Niagara, the host community in Windsor, the host community in Rama, uh, crime did not increase. But one thing Chief, uh, Deputy Chief should have told you, <laughs> the casinos paid for extra policing and put lots of money into hiring officers. So it's not the issue that gambling does or does not do, it's what sort of gambling do we have? What social arrangements do we make? What social and uh, institutional uh, changes that we bring in budget changes in the allocation of the surplus that is generated. How much back did we put into problem gambling, into the health system, into the educational system, uh, and into the supporting systems? Uh, the other issue is that, yes, indeed, there are other issues. There's noise, there's congestion, there are things. But people would really say, look, I mean, Hamiltonians are not going to have a casino, and this would be a new thing. In many respects, they gamble. They have uh, Flamborough, they could go even to Mohawk. Uh, uh, if they are adventurous, they go to Niagara and get fleeced. Uh, but they could really definitely uh, uh, have many uh, important access. 69%, uh, as you were told, uh, play the lotteries. And uh, there is really an issue here. To what extent a responsible community uh, would want to evaluate in a proper, balanced way not only the positive benefits, but all the social costs attendant to this, and what sort of price, and what sort of arrangement that one could conjure, could construct, so that they maximize the benefits. I would not really, I would advise you as an economist, don't take this casino without the convention center, without another node. Uh, let these people who are going to make these millions on the back of the ignorant and the hopeful, that they invest in this community and invest profusely and generously. Uh, you are really before an important choice, and in a democratic system, it's your choice, and uh, let's make this choice on a balanced, a more appropriate, and a more informed one. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I stated at the outset that I hoped that we would uh, listen very carefully, and I think we have, and that we would learn a lot, and I know I've learned a lot. Uh, and I think, thank all of the panelists for their perspectives and their contributions. Well, as I said, this is an evening to uh, not only learn, but also to listen. And we're here to listen to the community. And so we're going to have a question and answer period. Uh, you have some options. You may direct a question to a particular panelist, and that panelist will be asked to answer that question. Uh, however, the other members of the panel will also be able to uh, address your question if, uh, if they so wish. Uh, we are going to give you a maximum of two minutes each. Uh, Pastor Small will hold the mic. And when two minutes are up, you're going to hear this little noise. Uh, there. A little louder noise. And, <laughs> and uh, we're going to ask you at that point to please wrap up your, um, uh, wrap up your comments. Uh, again, we're looking uh, for your questions or your comments. If you would feel so inclined to, uh, to share uh, a comment or if you have a question that's answered and then you want to comment, uh, we're going to do that. We're going to give you every opportunity to participate in a meaningful way but we ask you to please uh, observe the two-minute rule with us. Now, um, is, no, Allison is gone, right? Okay. Oh, Mike, thank you. Mike uh, is going to hand out these little cards. If you would like a card to put a question on, 
just let Mike know, okay? Mike's in the corner there. There's a hand over there, Mike. Anybody else over here? If uh, you would rather put a written question in rather than a verbal question, uh, we're determined to get as much input as we can. I see the clock is about quarter to eight. Uh, we've got about an hour allocated to this. We'll see how it goes, and uh, we'll go from there. I would also ask you that when you, before you ask your question or make your comment, that you give us your name and that you give us where you're from. And, and don't say just Flamborough. If you're from Flamborough, we'd like Waterdown or Carlisle or Rockton or Orkney or any one of the other 16 settlement areas. If you're from Hamilton, uh, east, west, south, north. Uh, if you're from uh, Glanbrook, you know, whether it's Binbrook or Mount Hope, that would be helpful, I think, in terms of uh, where we proceed from here. Let's have some fun with this. Let's respect each other. Let's listen carefully. And uh, let's go from here. The very first questioner answer. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yes. Um, I'm from Freelton. And first of all, I want to say... Can I have your name, please? I'm sorry. Car Carolyn Stoppel. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to find that... Um, to say that we're even having this debate, I find it disturbing. Um, I find it disturbing that we um, get a source of income, uh, such a big source of income um, from gambling. Um, I know there's this, I guess there's this sign I've seen once when I went to the casino and it said, know your limit as you go out. Well, if we right now recognize that there's something like five, I think the last speaker said 5,000 um, people that have gaming issues and for every one person, there are 17 affected. So now if we move this casino to Hamilton, uh, to a larger population, um, I wonder what, uh, you know what the total of people would be that are addicted and uh, their family members and so forth so I worry about that also uh, we have I think in an hour I could get to something like six casinos um, and I'm just wondering why we need a bigger larger casino uh, when we already have so many that are you know accessible for people uh, having one in Hamilton um, you know I guess you get public trans uh, Transit um, is just so easy to to you know increase the gambling um, problem. So. All right, thank you, anyone? Tony. You want to take a shot at this, or uh... um, as I said from the outset, the the money that Ontario Lottery and Gaming generates that the province asks us to generate goes back to the province. We generate seven billion dollars a year. That's on our lottery and gaming properties. Two billion of that goes to the government for health care, 1.5 billion to hospitals, 500 million dispersed to education, health, charities, that type of thing as well too. And if we look at our business model uh, as we exist, um, we were in trouble. We're, we're a corporation. We're a revenue generator for the province of Ontario. And we saw that our profits to the province were flatlining. Um, and in this day and age, when governments are facing greater deficits, and there's a greater need for uh, increased revenues. Um, they asked us if we can possibly do our part. But as also as a, as a business, we have to look at our business model. And 10 years ago, our border facilities, Windsor, Niagara, Sault Ste. Marie, Point Edward, were generating $800 million. But because of factors across the border, the Canadian dollar, 9-11 passport restrictions, no smoking regulations, and increased competition on the other side of the border, those revenues are down to $100 million. Still sounds impressive, but for a revenue generator for the government of Ontario, we need to keep up our part of this commitment. And we did look around the province, and we did see that there were areas of the province that the demand for gaming products uh, was, there was an underservicement for it as well. And we looked at that, and that's why we decided to do this modernization program and also do some redirection of some of our gaming properties. We closed a few, and we're opening up a few as well, too, in areas that the customers want us to be. Can, can I ask you, Tony, uh, if I can expand on the question I think you asked, is why so many? Why 29? In March of, of uh, 2012, there were 27 properties. We closed down three properties in uh, Windsor, Sarnia, and Fort Erie because there was an oversupply of gaming in that market. We are down to 24. We are proposing five new facilities, one in the greater Toronto area, one in North Bay, one in Belleville, one in Kenora, and one in 
Wasaga Beach, Collingwood area. Thank you. Uh, so that's five new facilities in areas that uh, we, we believe that there is an underservice of our product. And this is something that, this is our business, and we need to um, uh, understand, and we need to um, address what the needs of our customers are. And this is where they want us to be. Thank you. Any other member of the panel? Doctor? I hate to be a, a party pooper here, but uh, <laughs> uh, let me say this. I agree totally that quite a bit of this money that we are raising is going to very good and noble social things. But think of it on the other side. This is a, a regressive tax. The poor are paying the greatest proportion of this tax. And in this respect, you have to balance. You have to balance, you know, what this revenue is going for and who's paying for it. Would you not like to have this money spent on education and health, but let the rich pay for it, not the poor? All right. You want this? Uh, Mr. Burns. Just to comment um, something that Dr. Kabersi just said. Um, the one is that, that it's simply, it is a popular form of entertainment. There are people make a choice to go. Um, it's a value for money exercise and they choose to spend their money and people do that every day and how they want to spend their entertainment dollar. So be it, they go to a casino, the movies, horse racing, you pick it, people make their choices with their money. What we do know about gaming customers though, and OLG proving this out, is that a disproportion of their player base, an over rep sample, representative sample, comes actually from higher incomes. Um, casino players are generally older, wealthier, and better educated, and from a higher income bracket. Um, that plays itself out in jurisdiction after jurisdiction. OLG has done the same analysis of their player base, and they, you know, a strong representative from making over $75,000 a year because they pay people make a choice with their entertainment dollars. And that's one thing that the customers of OLG and are looking for new opportunities. And that's where they've seen their business decline in some places because it's not meeting their needs. And that's where they've chosen as a business operator to meet those demands. Okay, thank you very much. Um, you know, we're going to be here a long time when I look at the line up there. So we're going to make it as tight as we possibly can. And uh, would ask the uh, cooperation of the panelists, please. <laughs> your name and your address, sir, and your question or comment. Hi, my name is Ted Mansell. I'm the Executive Vice President of Service Employees International Union Local 2. We represent the workers at Flamborough Downs. I don't have a question, but I do have a comment. I understand that this is a very divisive issue in this community, and we will respect City Council's decision whether there will be a casino in Hamilton or not. But just for the record, uh, for what it's worth, we represent employees in many different industries, including the racetrack industry in Ontario. We also represent brewery workers, and I would find it very odd to have a debate on whether we should go back to prohibition because some people have a problem with alcohol. Um, but that's an issue that council will need to deal with. My only main concern here tonight as the union representing these employees is we are adamantly, adamantly asking council to please, if they approve a casino in Hamilton, to ensure it is located solely and specifically at Flamborough Downs in order to preserve the 3,000 direct and indirect jobs that we currently have in this community because of that facility. If a casino is put anywhere else in Hamilton, it will threaten those jobs and we will see the largest loss of jobs in the Hamilton community in recent history. So please, I hope everybody here supports Council. If they do go ahead with a casino in Hamilton, please ensure it's conditional on it being located specifically at Flamborough Downs in support of these jobs in our local community. Our kids have no other jobs to look forward to in this local community. We're losing jobs all the time. And to throw 3,000 people out of work, to put three or 400 or 500 new jobs downtown, which is what I'm hearing the debate is, there will be a net loss of 2,500 to 3,000 jobs. It doesn't make economic sense. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, next question or comment, please. And again, your name and where you're from, please. Uh, Elwyn Thornborough, and I am a Dundasian. All my life, I've lived and grew up in Waterdown, outside of Waterdown. Um, my question is, because I am a horseman, 
I want to know what, if this casino does go through and does go into Flamborough, what percentage of it is going to go to the horse people? We don't even hear that from any of the panel. All right. We just hear about how they're going to help gambling. And, I mean, they're already saying, the government's already said that out of that, we get 20% is 358 million goes to us. 10% goes to the horse, to the facility. 5% goes to the breeders who a lot of people have gone and invested money in raising horses. And the other is gone to purses. But nobody's telling us that if this casino goes through, what, what are we going to get out of it? All right, thank you. I, I think that it's probably fair to say that that's a provincial decision and there's no provincial representative here, but I'm going to ask Bruce perhaps if you'd like to comment on that. Sorry to put you on the spot, Bruce. But... No, that's, that's fine. The, um, as, as things exist today, um, we at, at Flamber Downs are still in negotiations with the OLG for a lease, and that lease is for the OLG to be able to operate their, slight, their slots at Flamber Downs. And, um, we're fairly confident that we and the OLG will reach a lease agreement. Now, having said that, right now the province's uh, position is that that money, any money um, from the lease arrangement with the OLG, is not at this time earmarked for horse racing. Uh, the OMAFRA panel that I spoke about earlier is the panel that has been struck by Ted McMeekin. Um, to make money available for horse racing in, they, they talk about a transitional fund. Um, they talked about that within their, um, both their interim and their final report. At this point in time, we don't know what that amount of money is. So uh, at this point in time, we really can't say how much money will be available either for the race tracks to run racing or for uh, horse people to run their horses for that purse. So, at this point in time, there, is, there really has not been a definitive amount of money um, made available that we're aware of anyway. So. Okay, sorry, but that's the best answer we have for you. Your name, your community, and your question or comment, okay, please. Okay, my name is Patricia. I live in Stony Creek. And my question originally was going to be to uh, Hannah Holmes, but unfortunately she didn't make it tonight. Uh, I was on her website today and was wondering if she had ever conducted research, consulted, or published any papers in any journals related to gaming. So I will ask Dr. Kabersi if he's done this. And, be, and as he contemplates his answer, let me just uh, you know, remind you again that Professor um, Hannah, oh help me with the name, Holmes, Holmes sorry, Hannah Holmes uh, will be uh, participating in tomorrow night's debate at City Hall. So maybe that will be helpful. But Dr. Kabersi, do you have a comment? Uh, yeah, I, I published quite a bit actually. I wrote a paper and it's published on the cannibalization of uh, uh, gaming. You know, how can one measure this? What would be the uh, upper limit and the uh, lower limits on the extent to which casinos have taken money away from households and away from different competing businesses. Uh, I've done quite a bit that is not published, but in the public record, uh, I've estimated the economic impact of horse racing on Ontario and the tracks and the municip hosting municipalities. Uh, I've done quite a bit on the review of the three commercial casinos. Uh, I was involved in every single study uh, on uh, the establishment of the uh, major commercial casinos and reviews six months, one year, and five years. Uh, I was very much gun ho on the casinos at the border where we bring the Americans, take their money, and send their problems back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Can we have the next question or comment, please? <laughs> Yes, your, hi. your name and your community, please, and then your question or comment. I'm Kathy McMaster. I'm from Rockton, Ontario, so I'm Flamber Ward 14. First, I have a comment because I brought my trusted little calculator with me. If we look at the population of Ontario, which is 12 million or thereabouts, and we look at the number of people who can gamble, it's probably 6 million or thereabouts. And if you put into, 29, into this province 29 of those gambling facilities, you're putting in a facility for every 207,000 people.
That really saturates the province, and it only tells me just how badly our province needs money. But I keep track of the deficit and the debt, debt anyway, so I'm already aware of it. My question is the following. You say that you will approach private interests to build these casinos. Will you, in fact, have any control on the house return to the gambler? In other words, um, we look at Las Vegas, and I think the house return is 87%. What is the house return to the gambling individuals going to be with these casinos? Thank you, Kathy. Tony? Ma'am, we have that information on our website, and we're very open with it as well, too. Um, the, our, our slot machines, um, there is a regulation for our slot machines, and I believe it is 85% return on the life of those machines, um, and, and, and we have that public as well. Okay. So do I go with 85%? And, and, and many times in, it is a little higher as well, too, but the, the lowest limit is 85% on the rate of return. All right, Paul Burns wants to... Uh, it's set in regulation by the alcohol and game in fact, the it's probably closer to 92% in terms of the, pay, right, the operating current environment in Ontario. The regulation sets a minimum, but the reality is, is that the operating parameters today in Ontario is probably about 92%. Um, it, the games are regulated and overseen with the rules of play, and, and every machine is tested by the Alcohol and Gaming Com Commission of Ontario. So there is a third-party oversight to the industry. That will only get enhanced through this process with private operators. And it's also under the current RFPQ process that the OLG has instigated. They've laid down a number of operating parameters to the operators up front to saying this is sort of the outline of the framework in which you will be allowed to operate. So they are very prescribed. Okay. Right, thank you. Your name, your community, your question or comment, please. Uh, I'm Susan Wilkinson from Central Mountain in Hamilton. My question is for Mr. Barber. Um, come March, should the government cease subsidy to the horse racing um, industry? Would horse racing continue at Flamborough? And if it doesn't, would a casino be more uh, beneficial in Flamborough still or in Hamilton? Bruce? Um, I'm qualified to make the comment on horse racing. I'm not sure about the... Uh, economic dynamics of a casino in Flamborough versus Hamilton, but on horse racing, if there's no support uh, coming out of the OMAFRA panel for horse racing after March 31st, uh, there will be very little or no horse racing, not just at Flamborough, but in the province of Ontario. Uh, the paramutual wager um, doesn't generate, with the exception of perhaps Woodbine, doesn't generate the kind of money that would allow racing to to stay at Flamborough Downs. So, um, in effect, no, not without support. Thank you. Uh, are there any written questions from the floor that we haven't collected? You've got some? Mike? Uh, Judy was going to formulate those questions. Mike's going to? Okay, go ahead. Uh, question one uh, for Dr. Richardson. What research has gone into the impact and consequences that this will yield to youth if casinos move to a larger population, especially considering the introduction and rollout of online gambling. So there's a, there's a fair amount of research out there. As I said earlier, there's, there's a fair amount there, but there's also room for a lot more. Specific to the issue of youth, as I've talked about, there's, there's because youth gambling is not legalized within Ontario, it's, it's harder to find out those numbers. A lot of the survey methodologies and whatnot are, that are done I don't necessarily address them, but the, um, there is evidence that there is youth gambling going on. Um, in terms of internet gambling, that, as I understand it from the literature, and maybe Robert could answer this better than I, um, that internet gambling isn't well understood. There isn't a large um, uh, percentage of the population participating in it at the present time, and it does apparently tend to, look, to have particular characteristics in terms of who participates in it. It tends to be uh, better off um, uh, gamblers who tend to uh, also do casino gambling, as I understand it. But Robert, you may have some more to add. Use our particular concern. Um, we're, we're, as you mentioned actually earlier in your presentation, we're now really, uh, our youth are, are living in a gambling saturated society. We've got gambling promoted everywhere. 
And it's oftentimes twinned with all sorts of very positive role models in that. If you think about poker, for example, and the, the role modeling that's happening there, a lot of kids that actually really sincerely believe they're going to grow up and become a professional gambler. If you look at our schools, we're getting reports all the time of all sorts of problems related to gambling happening in our schools. And there's a particular concern about the convergence of gambling and gaming. There's real similarities between the two. A lot of kids are getting involved in, over-involved in internet use and gaming. And there's some concern that our youth, through their gaming experiences, are actually becoming groomed to develop a problem with gambling later in life. The other thing that we're concerned about is that the expansion of gambling that's being contemplated not only includes internet gambling, and we believe, you know, the OLG has taught, by the way, the OLG is, we think, pretty good at keeping youth out of casino type operations. I, I, I can say that. They're good at that. They take that very seriously. Um, we, we think that they're going to, you know, they've talked about very, very stringent requirements around registration and that to keep youth from gambling on the internet. So that's good. We're concerned, though, about this, this vague notion about new technologies being looked at. For example, BC is now starting to offer gambling on mobile devices through your iPhones, for example. And there was an interesting comment made by somebody who did some uh, research on youth in, uh, on the market in BC. Uh, they had a collection of people in there was a young lady there and somebody talked about gambling over a handheld device and she said, well, finally, you're talking to me. We're talking about gambling being available on any screen of any size that you, look, that you can think of. And the gambling industry is clearly moving towards trying to appeal to a younger demographic and the trend is to try to converge gambling with a gaming type experience. So I think we all should be concerned about our youth. Thank you very much. I, uh, I uh, want to ask uh, or give Paul Burns an, an opportunity to respond, but it, it perhaps also, Tony, if you're so inclined, because I think it's maybe the elephant in the room. I'm glad somebody asked the question about internet gambling and youth gambling um, and, and what role it plays and, and if they're the competition, the real competition that OLG is facing and so forth, but I'm going to start with uh, Paul. Internet gambling is here. It's been here. Uh, Can Ontarians, Canadians have had unfettered access probably for a better part of a decade. Um, we've seen percentage of population go from 1% to 8% in less than a decade. Um, and it's all illegal. Um, that's the one part that a lot of people don't know. The current offering for gaming and for Ontarians, so whether it's poker stars, Full, you know, full Hill Poker when they were in business, Bet365. Um, it's here, and people, I can gamble on my mobile device today. Um, OLG isn't going to contribute, start that direction. It's been there. People are there. Canadians are probably spending close to $10 billion a year online. Offshore gaming companies based in Europe and other parts of the world are reporting revenue out of Canada in excess of a billion dollars a year. So what we're looking for as an industry and we've been waiting for is organizations like OLG to get to meet the market demand, but also in a regulated environment and meet the standards that Canadians expect and the provinces expect to deliver when it comes to access, problem gambling, and information and responsible gaming protections on those on those sites and and so we've seen that, that it's here it's uh, you know I know that for a fact on sports betting alone there's over four billion dollars wagered by Canadians in offshore sports books right now um, so there is those devices are here the access is here it's um, and I and the one strong point about gambling on the internet is you're no longer anonymous that's the one strong point is that the companies and organizations know who you are and know how to access you and know that you're a resort. So the point being is you can walk into a casino today and play with money and walk out and leave and they don't know who you are. 
the fact of the matter is the internet is not anonymous and so there are protections but organizations like OLG because there has been no law enforcement actions taken to restrict the offshore access to online gaming. Thank you. I just want to alert the panel that I think that in the interest of everybody tonight I'm going to give them an opportunity, those who want, to maybe wrap up with a minute or two at the end of the evening. So if there's something that you think you want to share that we didn't have the opportunity, I, I want to give you that opportunity. Uh, your name and your hometown and a very familiar face in your question or comment, please. My name is Jojo. I'm a resident of uh, West Hamilton. I also have, uh, have an interest in the horse racing business. Uh, it's pretty obvious that uh, all pretty well known that the the moves by OLG is pretty, uh, devastating the uh, horse racing industry. I mean, everybody's worried. People are very nervous. And uh, my question is to uh, uh, two questions actually. One to the OLG uh, member and also the uh, uh, Mr. Murray. Uh, you say you're negotiating with the OLG. Have you give? Are you given any consideration to racing at Flamborough? or Georgian to, to, to keep this in the racing industry going. What consideration are you giving to help us survive? Because, I mean, we are dying as an industry. I'm talking about the racing, uh, racing industry. A lot of people here are very nervous about their jobs, their investments, and we don't hear anybody talking about helping us save this industry. And that kind of bothers us. So. Are you giving any consideration to doing something for us? What is it? In, what is it like? What can we expect from you if you get the support or get a new deal to give the casinos at, at Flamborough? All right, I, I'm going to give Tony an opportunity to respond. And and who was your that, this one is from Mr. Murray, but I got another one for uh, the OLG agent. Now, you, when you present the new model to make money for the province, it sounds very elegant. But I, I detect a very cynic, cynical approach to exploiting the poor to generate money for the government. Now, if you continue the way you're going with this new model and you make all the money that you want to make and destroy an industry like the horse racing industry, aren't we going to be a burden on the government again by going on welfare, unemployment? I mean, wouldn't it be better for us to be working and paying taxes to the government instead of trying to kind of take thank, it out? Thank you, Jojo. Tony? Uh, first of all, I'd like to say I'm a big fan of yours, Jojo. From uh, I'm a former TV journalist, and uh, I do remember you as well. Um, as, as Bruce mentioned, and as, as the, the, the chair mentioned as well too, the, the decision to end the slots of racetrack funding was a government decision. What we asked is to end the prescriptive policy of the slots specifically at racetracks. If we're going to get the private sector involved, we need to give them options. And the old policy, which was a good policy at the beginning that started in 1998, was the expansion of, of, of uh, gaming and gambling in Ontario will be restricted to racetracks only. If you're going to get the private sector involved, you need to give them options. You can't tell them where they have to buy something. They won't buy it. If we're going to get the private sector involved, we're going to get their capital. We're going to have them take over the running of the day-to-day -day operations. We need to give them this option. And that's what OLG asked of the government, to end the prescriptive policy of limiting slots at racetracks only. The government, I, can't, and I apologize, I can't speak on behalf of the government, but it was clear in their budget that you know, they decided that $345 million would be spent in other areas, and that's their decision. Uh, we are negotiating with each of the racetracks, for a different uh, arrangement from tenant to landlord um, and we will be in those racetracks we believe for for a while yet because these are going to be short-term leases three to five years and we are expecting to hear from the horse transition panel on their funding as well too uh, beyond that i can't say much horse racing has been a, a long-standing tradition in ontario for a hundred years it was here before the slots of racetrack program we firmly believe there will be a horse racing industry after the slots of racetrack program. Second question, George, I'll make it quick, okay? This is real quick. Now, I'm sure your studies revealed uh, to you that, you know, the racing industry will be devastated by your new moves. Okay, fine. Now, the, the business partners you're looking for, as far as we're concerned, are not interested in keeping racing going. That's our problem. 
Okay, you've made the point. Now you got a question over here for, did you say Mr. Murray? Go ahead, Jojo. Mr. Murray. Mr. Burns. Uh, Mr. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Mr. So what's your question, Jojo? My question is, if we help you, if you get your new deal to get the, uh, the slots at, at uh, Flambro, what guarantees can you give us as a racing community that you'll keep racing going? Can you give us any guarantees? Will, will, will there be racing at Flambro? Let me, let, me, let me try, let me try if you want to add something well, to it. I would, yeah. Okay. Uh, let, me, let, me, uh, yeah, let, let me just give him a chance to get his thoughts together. But we did have, we, we called this at the chamber, we're calling this Super Wednesday because we had a meeting this morning with Ted McMeekin, who was the Minister of Agriculture, as you know, and that was a, a big part of the discussion this morning. Uh, he brought John Snowblum with him, who's a member of the OMAFR panel. And um, I think that it's fair to say, some of you were there this morning, I think it's fair to say that um, we can expect an announcement from the government on this issue shortly. And I hope and pray that at least there'll be some transitional funding uh, to help the horse industry survive. So now I interject to that. Bruce, add what you can. I think, I think Aaron, you answered it as well as I could. It's exactly where we stand today as far as racing goes. Um, until we see uh, what the OMAFRA panel uh, presents to the industry, as Aaron said, they expected either in the, very, in the next few days or, or the next week. At that point in time, we'll have a better idea as to how much funds will be available for racing, not just at Flamborough, but in all of Ontario. So it, it really is a matter of waiting to see. All right, I have one more, one more comment over here on that question. Thank you, Jojo. The one thing you have going for you in this community, and you must understand, is, is Great Canadian Gaming Corporation. They are the only company in the province that operates and owns a racetrack right now that also can operate a casino. They operate great facilities in British Columbia. None of the other racetracks, except for Georgian Downs, which they also own, is in that same position. And so I, I think that, that the chance of racing continuing, you know, is is greater with a company like them that operate horse racing and know how to operate horse racing. And I think that you're fortunate to have a good local partner in that regard right now. They have to bid for this. There's no guarantees. But the process is that know that you've got a company that knows horse racing and knows the casino gaming industry and, and not every other track community has such a thing going for them. Right, thank you. Michael, you got the next written question. This, uh, the question's for Tony. Tony, we have heard that regardless of this decision, slot machines are inevitable in Hamilton's downtown bingo halls. Is this true? Slot machines are inevitable in downtown bingo halls. Is this true, Tony? So this is a question I've been answering for the last several days, and I can emphatically say no. The issue of the revitalization of the bingo industry in comparison to what's happening to the horse racing industry are two different issues. They're trying to be clouded together, but I have to tell you that there are two different issues. The revitalization of bingo started back in 2005, when, ironically, slots were put into racetracks, and bingo halls started to see a decline. Also, in the addition of the no smoking ban, uh, the decline uh, was... Uh, was sped it up, definitely was sped up. So the industry itself uh, came up with a plan, and their plan was to innovate. Bingo innovation uh, over 30 years was from cardboard cards to paper cards and from discs that you put on the numbers to dabbers. That was the innovation in the bingo industry. So they really saw the light and saw that they really had to change or they would not be an industry anymore. And this is an industry that really... Uh, focuses on charities. There is a small staff in a bingo hall, but the, the majority of people that are, are there are volunteers for charities. So, if the bingo halls die off, the charities die off, uh, and the, or the funding for the charities die off, and right now, uh, there are 61 bingo halls compared to 230 bingo halls 10 years ago. And there are 3,000 charities, depending on those 61 bingo halls. 10 years ago, there were 6,000 charities. So they asked OLG to get their, get their heads together along with the bingo operators and the charities um, and they asked us to introduce electronic gaming. We piloted this electronic games uh, 
Whatever traditional games there are in a bingo hall, whether it be bingo, shutterboard, rapid draw bingo, or break open tickets, uh, there was now going to be an electronic version of that. Um, and you'll also have the option to play the paper-based bingo as well, too. So you'll have that option. And this is what has been piloted over the last six years, uh, since 2005. 2010, the government gave us the go-ahead to help the bingo industry roll this out. And this is what we're doing right now. Uh, so there are electronic games in bingo halls, but there's electronic bingo, electronic shutterboard, and break open ticket dispensers. And really this is what, if, uh, Chairman, if you give, allow me a few more moments, this is really what is at the heart of the issue, is the break open ticket dispensers. The evolution of break open tickets went from asking the retailer to put their hand in the plexiglass box, grab you a bunch of tickets, and you stand there, and you break them open. Then we went to a mechanical dispenser. You put your coin in the dispenser, you pull a lever. I'm not supposed to say this, but it looks like an old cigarette machine. You pull the lever and the ticket falls out, you break open the ticket. Now we have a box of tickets that are fed into a high-tech ticket scanner. You put in your coin, you press the button, the ticket comes out, you break open the ticket, and the innovation here is you see the representation of that ticket on a display screen. Slot machine is very different. Slot machine has a computer brain. Slot machine has a random number generator. Slot machine has a variety of plays, and, and uh, the, 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 Dr. Murray and, and everyone, and Dr. Richardson told us what the difference, you know, what you can do with a slot machine. These are not slot machines. These are high-tech ticket scanners that spit out a ticket, and this is what the bingo industry helped develop over the last uh, uh, six, seven years. And this is what we're implementing today. And because OLG is responsible for electronic games in the province of Ontario, that's why we're involved in this as well, too. So the short answer is no slot machines at bingo halls. The real answer is electronic ticket dispensers at bingo halls, along with electronic bingo and paper bingo as well. Thank you. Mr. Murray. And for the installation of automated gambling machines in bingo halls, in fact, um, we're providing training to those centers on how to manage um, that innovation to the, uh, the bingo industry. And I just have to say, we have concerns. These are automated gambling machines. They're not strictly a slot machine, as was stated, because they don't have a random number generator in it. But the type of experience that the player will have with the automated gambling machines will be very similar to the experience of slot machine play. That's a concern. Um, and so we feel that there isn't that big a distinction that exists here between those machines and slot machines as portrayed by the previous speaker. There just, there just isn't. And that's being confirmed, by the way, by a fellow out of the University of Waterloo, a Dr. Harrigan, who's done in-depth research on slot machines. And he's looked at, he's actually visited with one of my staff to one of these facilities, and he also has major concerns. All right, thank you. <laughs> Your name, community, question or comment, please. Uh, my name is Amar, I'm from uh, Hamilton East Mountain. Uh, I have a question, I guess, for uh, Dr. Richardson. Well, first of all, I wanted to thank the entire panel. You guys have all shed a lot of light on a, a lot of important issues. So, I mean, obviously, applause is due uh, for, for the uh, entire panel. Uh, but specifically for uh, uh, Dr. Richardson, I know you said that uh, a two-part two -part question, first part. You said when you bro were brought on your original role that there wasn't much of a mandate towards uh, casino uh, gambling trends and effects on health. So have you had a lot of... Uh, research opportunities on this matter prior to being brought on by the city of Hamilton for your uh, for your report number one um, number two uh, actually through through Twitter uh, a friend of mine put me across uh, a research article by uh, a professor from uh, Laval University uh, professor uh, Le Dussier, I believe it was and actually the findings are almost starkly the opposite of, of what you stated with regards to proximity and um, the fact that uh, risk gamblers or uh, problem gamblers are more uh, uh, more likely to occur in an area that's uh, 
closer proximity to uh, to a casino. So I mean, it's just completely contradicting. I just don't know if you've come across that or if you've read it yourself. Um, All right, thank you for your comment, Dr. Richardson. So a couple of things. If you could just before you leave the mic, just what were you saying that Ladis uh found? Because I, I think I misunderstood what you said. That um, the perceived theory or threat of uh, increased uh, problem gamblers is uh, not in correlation with, uh, has nothing to do with correlation to proximity. Okay. All right, so just to clarify a few things, my role in particular is not around gambling for the city of Hamilton. That's not, and I wasn't brought on to do this study. I'm the medical officer of health, so I've been for 14 years overseeing the public health programs. What I was saying is that public, the gambling as a public health issue has really emerged over the last three years and then become something that public health uh, units, medical officers of health have paid more attention to of late. And as well, we run a treatment program um, that is funded by the province. So I'm not a researcher, and I wouldn't pretend to be. I mean, the people at CAMH, such as Mr. Murray here, and, um, and many others know far more about the science of gambling and the, the health, the effects and all those sorts of things. I'm a consumer of that research. And so we look um, more broadly at research that comes from many, many sources. And Toronto Public Health did do a, uh, what's called a systematic review, which means you look at all the studies that are done out there, sort out which ones are of higher quality and, and less high quality, and try to summarize the, um, the results that come from those. And so as I, as I said when I was speaking earlier, I'm not surprised that you can find studies that show something different. And we find that in every aspect of, of research, I'm sure. Um, you can uh, agree with that. And as well, um, we find that you know, throughout health and medicine that you'll find studies that show one thing um, and another study that some shows something else. And that's why we need to look at all of the studies taken together. So when you look at the issues of accessibility and proximity, when you look at all of that together, and that's what Toronto did just recently along with CAMH, they did find that proximity overall um, uh, in that research does have a role to play in terms of, of the incidence of, of problem gambling. So I think that just, I think you had asked the two questions about my role in particular with respect to it and about that study in particular. So I hope I've covered off what you're asking. Thank you. Dr. Kabershkin, do you have uh, any comment on, uh, on the question? Well, I mean, uh, it's a valid point that he's bringing about and uh, that this area has so many different contributions and that there is no unanimous uh, findings here. But uh, certain things are incontrovertible. I mean, one thing we know, that close proximity is a direct relationship with the increase in problem gambling. Accessibility is an important factor. Now, this is independent of the size of the population. I understand that. I mean, uh, you could really have a small casino in a small area, but it's in the backyard of everybody, and you would expect to see the proportion of the population with gambling problems to rise. But this is independent of the size population, but this does not in any way invalidate that accessibility is a major cause. Thank you. Mr. Murray? Uh, with respect, there really is consensus in the field that increased accessibility increases participation rates in problem gambling. And if you want, to, you want to verify, at least in terms of participation rates, just look at what the gambling industry is wanting to do here in Ontario. They're wanting to increase accessibility in order to grow the business. That's why they're doing it. It's a commercial reason. And, and, and I'm sorry, good or bad, um, that, that will lead to increased gambling rates and just inevitably an increase in the people who are negatively affected. Thank you. Michael, you're up. This question is for OLG from uh, Tony Simeone from, uh, sorry, Tony Simeone from Waterdown. Do we know who the new private operators are going to be and how does one qualify for becoming an operator? We're not at that stage yet where we've put out the uh, formal request for proposals. Um, we still have to hear from the municipality in terms of uh, what direction they want to take. The debate that we're having here tonight is something similar that they've had in the city of Ottawa. Um, very different than what's happening in Toronto, because Toronto would be a new facility. Uh, but in, in, uh, in Ottawa, same type of debate. Do we keep it at the racetrack, or do we keep it, or do we move it uh, downtown? And that, again, will be up to the private sector operator. Once we hear from the municipality on which direction they want to go, whether open up the city or keep it 
uh, just at the racetracks. Then we will uh, put out the request for pre-qualification, which is really uh, to get the best of the best uh, and get us a short list. And then we'll forward on to, uh, they'll be invited to the uh, request for proposal stage, which will actually be the bids. We hope to have a decision uh, in 2013 or very early in 2014 once the uh, procurement process goes through. I'm going to take a, I'm going to take a, a run a risk here that I'm going to get into trouble, Tony, but have you not already completed the pre-qualification process? Have you not identified those who are eligible to bid? No, not for every zone. Right now we have pre-qualifications out for Ottawa, for Eastern Ontario, and for Northern Ontario. Those are the three, oh, I see. Okay. Er, uh, three areas that we've, uh, we've gone out to because those, in those areas, the municipalities have made their decisions whether they want to be willing hosts. We have better ideas of where those facilities are going to be. Uh, and this is a massive procurement project, one of the biggest in Ontario. Uh, we have to do it in phases. We have to wait for the municipalities as well to make their decisions. Um, and in order for our people to do it properly and be able to manage this whole big process, we do need to do it in phases. So, um, well, let me ask another. Let me ask yeah. a, another question in an attempt to be helpful. Uh, what are the basic criteria to qualify? Uh, that would allow an entity to bid. Sure. So you, you really do have to be uh, a, a gaming operator. You have to have some experience in the gaming industry. Um, if uh, you decide that you want to open up Joe's slot company and think you can run a gaming facility and you put your bid and you put your qualifications in, I have a feeling that you're not going to uh, be able to be there. But you have to show us that you are qualified, that you have worked in the industry, show us your financials, uh, various other credentials to show us that you are legitimate. Uh, and we, there are a lot in, uh, in this country. Um, there are a lot in North America, a lot around the world. So we'll look at the, the best of the best. Um, and then we will boil that down and then invite that group to the RFP stage. All right. Your comment or question, your name and your hometown, please. Uh, my name is uh, Pat Haru, and I'm from North Burlington, but this affects us because my husband has um, standard bred horses, and he has the horses that he trains are qualified for Philambro, cannot race at the big tracks like a lot of people here. Um, and uh, we are the majority of the horse racing people because uh, not the minority have the big horses that make the big money. Uh, that's the minority. The majority of horse people are the ordinary farming people with three or four horses. Um, and this is their living, our living. I hear you, but now okay, tonight's no, meeting is about casinos. No, no <laughs> it's about gambling. This is it's about gambling. Now, my a question here is that horse racing should never be a, uh, put in the terms of gambling. Because when you gamble, you pull a lever on a slot machine. Um, but my question is, wh now, why? Well, it, it's a comment. I'm allowed a comment. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, it's a comment, not a question, a comment. My comment here is that why the OLG should put gaming to do with horse racing. When you game, you pull a lever, you throw a card. With horse racing, anyone who's in the industry, you look at a, car, a, a sheet, the sheet tells you the qualifications of the horse, tells you the class the horse is racing in, tells you it's past lines, and you are betting on maybe eight or nine horses and you if a person is in the industry or betting on the horses it's not gaming I hear you thank you for your comment <clears throat> okay the uh, next person please your name and your community and your question or comment please hi my name is Brian Tropi I'm the general manager of the Ontario Harness Horse Association I'm from Rockwood but many of my members are living in the Flamborough and Hamilton area um, during the gaming modernization process, we had an opportunity, I personally met with the OLG, and during that discussion, we were told that absolutely that the OLG understood that there had to be a revenue sharing agreement with the horse people. For If it wasn't for horse racing, there would be no slot program. Going back to 98, when the referendums were done, the people of Ontario voted then that they didn't want slots. That's why they came to the racetrack, and it was an agreement. 
based on those agreements and based on the fact that we always had what was categorized as a successful partnership with the OLG and the fact that the OLG entered into an, an additional five-year renewal term within the last two years. These people that are sitting in the audience today invested tens of thousands of dollars, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars, that they'll never have a chance to recoup. As the official spokesperson for the OLG, what would you like to say to these people? As, I, as, I've, as I've said before, and I continue to say, we respect the horse racing industry. It's a long tradition in, the, in Ontario, and there, were, there was horse racing before there was the Slots at Racetrack program. It's a government policy to end the funding to Slots at Racetracks. We asked for the prescriptive location restrictions to be lifted, and the government lifted that, but then they went a little further and decided that their funding, that their priority was not for this industry. And again, we believe um, that there will be a horse racing industry after the slots. But the slots aren't leaving right now. Slots will be here for a while, and it will be up to the private sector to decide whether they do want to keep the slots at the racetracks or not. And we have to look at some of the properties that are out there. Again, Great Canadian is, is a, you know, great work. We have a great working, working relationship with them. And some of the slot and some of the racetracks are where the customers are in downtown locations. Western Fair in London, downtown. In Innisfil, two minutes from downtown Barrie. Um, so is, is it going to be gone entirely? We don't believe so. Uh, but it will be up to the private sector to decide what they want to do with those gaming facilities and if they want to continue to be uh, a renter. Um, at, at the racetracks, and they will be working with the racetracks on this. I'm going to uh, suggest to you folks, it's 8.35 or so, that we give the people that are in line an opportunity to speak, uh, and that will shut it down at that point. So we still got one, two, three, four, five, or six people there. Let's see where that brings us for time, and, um, and then we'll perhaps wrap it up. Your name, community, question, or comment, please. My name's Michelle, and I'm from Waterdown. I wanted to address everybody here and the councillor mem members here to, I'm not against gambling, I'm in the horse racing business and that's basically how we make our living, but it's, my, it's the agreement with the OLG and the provincial government that makes me very worried. Um, they, in their modernization plan, they talk about on one page that we have too many gambling sites in Ontario, we're cannibalizing each other. Two pages later, they want to put in 29. They have four casinos in Ontario. In 2011, they lost, I think it says, $92 million. The slots at racetracks made $924 million. They want to push 29 casinos on municipalities, and they have four that are losing money. They've explained in their financial highlights here why it's lost money or the revenue has gone down. Those circumstances have not changed. We still have passports. We still have no smoking. All that stuff is the same. How is a new casino, actually 29 of them, going to make this city and every other municipality that you're trying to sell this to more money? Five to seven million dollars. Well, the slots already make four plus. I asked the police commissioner, although no significant increase in crime rate, What's the estimated increase in cost to our policing services? All right. Deputy Chief. We don't know. Exactly. In all honesty. I don't think the OLG knows what the city is actually going to make. They're, they say that the cut, they're trying to get to the customer. The customer wants us to be more accessible to them. They lost money at four of them. All and right. I, I, I hear, you're, you're, you've made your point. Thank you very much. Going. Thank you. All right, your name, your community. I'm sorry. Yes, Tony, I'm sorry. Uh, I would like to address one of the comments. There are not going to be 29 new casinos out there. There are currently 24 facilities out there. We're, at, we're, we're proposing five, we're proposing, ma'am, we're proposing five new facilities out there. We closed three down because we were looking at our business model. So there are not 29 new casinos out there. 
Casinos are here. Slot facilities are here. Slot facilities and gambling is... All right, thank you, thank you. I, you've made your point. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, Tony. No, I and, given and I, I just wanted to point that out. So it's not 29 new facilities out there. It's five, it's five new facilities. And, and again, OLG provides $2 billion in profit to the government of Ontario. Right, thank you. Based $7 billion revenues. Your name and community and question or comment, please. My name is Matthew Green, and I'm from the No Downtown Casino community. And my comment first is this, Mr. Atif Kabursi, Dr. Abers Kabursi, I appreciate that you're here 10 years ago. I sat in one of your classrooms. And in fact, it was your study that you wrote in conjunction with Don Jaffrey in 96 when Hamilton passed on a downtown casino the first time that led me on this mission. So for that, I thank you. And to Dr. Richardson, I thank you as well. Although I'll, I'll comment on this, I find it ironic that the only two doctors on this entire panel have been questioned about their credentials. So, following the lead of my friend from Carmen's, I'd like to ask the gentleman on this side. I'm not sure which one of you guys has a PhD, but I would like to ask Mr. Burns, who is the only lobbyist that is unregistered here in Hamilton, what evidence-based research do you have to present, sir? What papers have you written, sir? And what qualifies you to be here educating us on the Dale County Casino? <laughs> Mr. Well, Burns. I don't have a PhD. I haven't written any papers. Uh, as an association, we have asked a lot of academics to write papers on behalf of the industry, and there's a number on our website, CanadianGaming.ca, um, including a more recent series uh, dealing with some of the issues we're talking about tonight. Um, my background in gaming goes back to um, the slots at Racetrack program as a policy advisor in the Harris government. Um, in back in 1997. I, uh, I'm not new to Flamborough. I remember sitting between the horseman and Mr. Jurovinsky uh, during one of what have some, become some legendary disputes over the years when the, um, whether we'll call it a lockout or a strike occurred between the, horse, the Horsemen's Association and the track. I'm very familiar with the industry in Ontario. I was part of the group when the last opportunity came along for the private sector to get involved in Ontario in the mid-90s that was part of the development of the Brantford Casino until we were asked to step aside by the Ontario government because they wanted to do it. Um, I have been in communities like this all over Canada and especially all over Ontario talking about gaming. I have seen the results of the industry. I, the good people that work in this industry that, that also bring, you know, have buy groceries in communities, live in communities and volunteer in communities and raise money for community organizations. That It's a positive uh, career experience. So as I look at it, I've, I have a long history in the industry and from a public policy perspective as well as from an operational perspective. So I bring that to this community. All right, thank you. Your name, your community, and your question or comment, please. Uh, yes, uh, Jeremy Skirman, a uh, farmer from uh, Millgrove, Ontario. Um, I, as a Christian, I share a deep concern for what this does to our poor, our disadvantaged, those who maybe have some, who are vulnerable to addictions or codependence. To the OLG, we don't need this in our town. Uh, our downtown has enough problems the way it is. Um, to our city councillors who see this as a revenue stream, You've spent us into a hole. And some of you sitting here tonight are responsible for this. Don't think this is the magic pill, because it's never going to work. These social problems will result in more costs to our government at different levels. We do not need a casino in this city. To the OLG, I want to ask, what price do you put on these social problems? I'm not sure that you have an answer for that, Tony, but you're welcome to comment. Again, we realize that gambling does have an inherent risk, and a small percentage of the population is at risk. We've talked about that. We've admitted that. We're not burying our heads in the sand, and we're not running away from that. Um, but we have a mandate from the government to provide gaming entertainment in Ontario, but we also have a mandate by the government to provide responsible gambling. I know it's somewhat ironic, and we, we admit that, uh, but this is what we have to do, 
and $40 million uh, of, of, of gambling revenue does go into responsible gambling programs. Uh, CAMH is a, benefactor, uh, a beneficiary of that. Uh, a lot of research is, is, is benefits from that as well too. And as we go along, as we learn a lot more from what's happening out there, um, we'll get better as well too. We're providing an entertainment option um, and no one's being forced to go to these facilities. Uh, no one's being forced to go to these facilities. And you have a choice if you want to go or you don't want to go. And 8 million people play the lottery each year. 2.3 million people visit our casinos at least once a year. They're making an entertainment choice. Um, and this is what our mandate is. And we have a double-edged mandate. And we will serve the people of Ontario that way. Okay. Donna, you're up. Sorry. Uh, Donna Skelly, I'm from Ancaster, but I'm also the uh, conservative, progressive conservative um, candidate here in this riding for the uh, province of Ontario. I have two questions to the representative from the OLG, and the first question is, can you give us the breakdown on uh, where the money will go uh, if a new casino comes into Hamilton? For every dollar that is gambled at the casino, how much goes to the casino operator owner, how much will go to the city? how much will go to the province, and what percentage is used to cover the costs of the OLG? And my second question... Just, just a minute, that's, that's a great question. Let me just let, let them answer that, okay? So the divvy up of the gambling dollar. We'll get to your second question in a minute. Sure, so we, uh, there is a, a funding formula in, in place right now um, that has been modified. So currently, um, Hamilton receives 5% uh, on uh, the first 450 slot machines and then a blended rate of 2%. Um, so as I mentioned, and I'm just trying to look for the numbers, um, it's about four, four, four and a half million dollars a year that the city gets um, in, in terms of that. The funding formula is changing. Come April 1st, the city will now receive 5.25% based on revenue, six, the, first 600, uh, the first 65 million. So we're looking at a possible increase of between five and seven million dollars annually, um, then they will uh, develop, and we're not into the tax assessment uh, portion of it, but we've been told that uh, uh, perhaps tax revenues could go up to uh, five, uh, sorry, 1.3, one to one, one to three million dollars per year. That goes to the city. We're looking at the jobs, the associated wages with that as well too. Um, so, but, 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 but let, let, let me just come back to the gaming dollar. Yep. Somebody puts a dollar into a slot machine. How is that divvied up? That's where we get into the complexities because it, 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 it's based on how much they put in, how much comes out. Um, <laughs> All right, just just, a, just but, but again, it's it, it's it, it's not it, it's not as clear. I, you believe me if you believe me, you, you don't if you don't. But it's not as clear cut because uh, slot machines return a certain amount. If you go to table games, table games return a different amount because there's a labor cost associated with table games. Tony, I'm going to invite you to come tomorrow night and answer that question. I will try, definitely. Right. Maybe second, the same answer. Yeah. Your my, second question, My Donna. second question is the current government is running a deficit about $14 billion. This didn't happen overnight. So why is there such a rush to ram these casinos through communities? You have given us a bit of an extension to talk about this, but this is such an emotional issue. It is highly charged. It's highly divisive. Why not give communities an opportunity to hold a referendum and let people decide if they want a casino? What's the rush? What it, it appears as if there is a hidden agenda. We announced the modernization of our industry back in March of 2012. Um, we began consultations with municipalities uh, about a month later as we announced the gaming zones. Uh, and we have been in consultations with these municipalities uh, since then. Um, some municipalities are, are done their consultations. Um, and some are still in the midst of it. Toronto's in the midst of it. Ottawa is complete. Um, under the old OLGC Act, of 1999, uh, there is, um, the municipalities can choose what they want to do in terms of consultation. There is no prescription for a referendum, if, but if they wish, they can. Uh, if they wish to hold consultations, they can. It's not written in legislation. So we 
we appreciate, we respect what the, the consultations that are going on. In various communities, we were up in, uh, in the Collingwood, Wasaga Beach area, we were there five times for consultations. Uh, we had a regional meeting for 500 people. We had a meeting just with Wasaga Beach with 300 people. We had a meeting just with Collingwood with 200 people. And then they conducted a web poll. Um, so we really do respect and appreciate what these municipalities are doing. And um, if you look at some of the voting records of by-elections and some referendums, the amount of people that actually come out to vote in percentage-wise compared to how many people are coming out to consultations or voting on web polls and Facebooks and, and, and having their voices heard through uh, emails and stuff like that, uh, there is a higher percentage of that population speaking now as there are in um, when municipalities have by-elections sometimes. Thank you. Thank you. We're down to the last two. Good evening. Uh, my name is Rick Hishon. I'm from Dundas Center. <laughs> like that. So I have a, a couple of things I want to just touch base about tonight. And uh, I guess my first question would be, is there anyone here from the Alcohol and Gaming Commission of Ontario as a rep? I don't believe so. Okay, that's too bad. So uh, I'll uh, address my remarks to the deputy chief, so he'll pass it on. Anyways, one of my great concerns, so I'll just let you know, everybody, I am a good customer of the OLG and Bruce's establishment, but I've gambled all over the world in different places and everything else like that, in different countries, different parts of Canada and everything else like that. My main point is, and what I've seen, and I'm going to take uh, exception to what Bruce said uh, a little bit ago about the payouts that are happening in the casinos nowadays. Um, the information that he put forth about 92% or 91 and 92% came from the Alcohol and Gaming Commission that did that study in 2009 and published it in 2010 on behalf of the OLG. Uh, I would dare to say nowadays, which is basically, and we're in the fourth year later, that those percentages have gone down and they're operating fairly close to that 85% minimum, possibly lower. I have very I'd say my word would be the complicity between the OLG and the operators, I'd have some question in deciding whether there's an a arm's length transaction. All right, you've got to be careful with your no, words. I understand that, okay. so I'm just going to, to, to leave so it wrap at that. it up. Uh, yeah, just because the, uh, you know, I can give you lots of examples over, you know, 2012, and I can go back to 1992 if you wish, but I've seen what Flamborough's had and done over the last 20 years, or close to 20 years that they've been, and you're putting more in the machines and you're getting less out of them. And, you know, just, I go away for two weeks on holidays in November, I come back and I look and all the penny machines that are on the one wall up there have gone from maximums 125 or 150 units or, you know, a dollar or a dollar 25. And now they're 250 and 300. Okay, I hear you, Rick. Thank okay. you for your comment. I, I will. Just, I will. I would challenge the panel that somebody look up the matter of uh, the return back to the uh, to the better. I think that's an important figure. Yeah. And the one. Other, uh, excuse me. Just the one other thing, and this is for our council. I know. It's just a comment for the council. Okay. Very quickly. Is that they made a very big mistake when they um, didn't put Ivor Wind down on the West End. We're not talking about Ivor Wing. Oh, no, no, no. We're not yeah. talking about Ivor Wing. Okay. Thank thinking. you. Thank okay. you, Pat. Uh, oh, oh. <laughs> just uh, one comment on that. All I can say is that it will never be below 85 because machines are designed and tested and programmed to not perform less than that and allowed on the floor. So okay. the operator can't even deliver a machine that could even possibly do something like that. Could it be less than 92? Yes, it could, but it will never be less than 85. Never less than 85. Your name, your community, your question. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, doctor. One comment. It doesn't matter. Let it be 
let it be any number, because the first time you play, say, it's 90%, you play it, you get 90% back. You put the 90%, you get 81%. You put the 81, you get 72. You put the 72, 63. <laughs> it won't take long before they wipe you out. Okay, I, I'm going to lay awake all night trying to figure out that map. <laughs> Uh, thank you for that comment. Your name, your community, your question or comment, please. Yeah, it's Wayne Smith from Mount Hope, Ontario. And uh, as a community, um, really appreciate this. And I really, really appreciate the people on the right-hand side, my right-hand side. I think if the councillors are paying any attention, I think you got a lot of good information here tonight in regards to gambling. Uh, I've been going to the races since I was this high. I don't have a gambling problem. I really enjoy going to the races. I've gone to the casinos. Um, a lot of what those people are saying, when I'm sitting here analyzing what they're saying, now I can see it. Um, I think if the casino is a place where you have to drive to, chances are if you have to drive to it, you own a car. Chances are you pay insurance on a car. Chances are you have money chances are you can afford to lose money. That doesn't mean you can't become addicted. I have a hard time with OLG and the province of Ontario. The OLG is fighting their ass off here to bring the bingos back in this province, but I don't see the OLG. I disagree with a woman here who's into horses. Gambling is gambling. If I take money out of this pocket and put it somewhere and I don't have a chance of getting the full amount of that money back, it's gambling. You gotta wrap it up. Huh? Okay, so the problem I have is OLG is fighting their hearts out to keep bingo and OLG. What is the problem with making a partnership with the horse racing business and fighting your ass off to save the horse racing industry? Right. And I hope, uh, uh, that's, I think that question has been asked six or seven or eight different ways tonight. Okay, it's a, it's a mandated issue, but we have a whole bunch of counselors here from our municipality, and I really appreciate them being here. You better take a drive out into the community for the councillors that live in downtown Hamilton. Take a drive out in the community and realize how many jobs are going to be lost here. All right, I heard you. Thank industry. you. I'm sure, I'm sure the councillors heard you too. We're just glad that they came up the hill. Thank you. Mike, is one more question? Okay. Yes, thank you. My name is Joe Chadak, and I'm a resident of Flamborough. I'm a farmer, I'm a horseman, I'm a breeder, and I'm a player. And what, what I don't understand, why doesn't the OLG just leave it as it is and add your casinos? Number two, I'm disappointed that Mr. McKeekin, my representative, is not here, who's the Minister of Agriculture, who should be fighting for us horsemen. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, the, uh, the clock that I'm looking at says it's three minutes to nine, and I think we're going to wrap it up. I remind you all of uh, tomorrow night's meeting. Before we close tonight, I promise the panelists an opportunity for a one-minute. Uh, please, please listen to them. See what they have to say. Let's extend with that courtesy those who want to. And then tomorrow night, the discussion continues at Hamilton City Hall. Uh, I'm going to start over here. Uh, Dr. Percy. Just only to say that shh, shh, casinos shh. are there, they are probably coming, but you really need to make sure that whatever you get, you get it after a thorough examination, and it should reflect the preferences and the wishes of people, and it should be a balanced way where we get the maximum benefits and minimize the social costs that they are real and they're there. Thank you. Dr. Richardson? I don't think I have much to add beyond uh, Dr. Kaversi. That approach in terms of uh, making sure we're making an informed decision, one heads up, eyes wide open about what the issues are associated with, uh, with gambling and problem gambling, whether they're health issues, social issues, economic issues, and making decisions that keep that ideal of maximizing the best benefit for our community in mind. And so considering all the factors that influence those things, what would be the decision related to that? And so uh, just thanks again for the, for the opportunity to be part of the panel tonight. Thank you. Mr. Murray? You know, just representing my organization, we're just very pleased that uh, we've been able to participate in a session like this, and we're trying to support a broad range of agencies that we work with to have similar kinds of inputs into the decisions that are made in the communities that they serve. 
Yeah, the, the best choice that you can make is one that's well informed. So I congratulate you for being here and, and, and participating in this. Um, and if you want further information from our end, certainly you can access it through problemgambling.ca. Thank you thank very you much. Very much. Thank you. Mr. Burns? I'd just like to say thank you. Um, I think that the, a great, healthy debate, and uh, uh, again, the Canadian Gaming Association has many studies and information on our website, canadiangaming.ca. And also, uh, just to say that you, uh, for, for horse racing industry and the opportunity does lie in having to say yes to a casino, uh, and then where the community chooses to have it becomes the next decision. So um, you're going about it the right way and look forward to tomorrow night. Thank you. Deputy Chief. Uh, our role is, is community and public safety, and so wherever the decision is to put a casino, or if there's not, we'll continue to work with all our partners to ensure that this community remains safe. Thank you. Thank you. Bruce? Thank you very much. I'd first like to thank uh, the city for having uh, this uh, opportunity to speak tonight and again tomorrow night. I think I'd like to leave the group with um, really one comment. Great Canadian and Flamborough are, is committed to horse racing at Flamborough Downs, but to be sure we do need support from the government for horse racing to continue after March 31st at Flamborough Downs or in the province of Ontario. So I'll leave that with the Thank you. Tony? Thank you very much. I, I respect all of your comments, all of your questions. I hope I've provided some information. Um, there's more information out there on modernolg.ca about what the experiences from the other communities are. And uh, Mayor Bertina's on there as well too. The benefits to Hamilton um, are easily demonstrated. And um, we'll see what the council decides. And they are your representatives. They will make the best decisions out there. And uh, Thank you very much. We'll see you tomorrow night. I just want to make two very quick comments in closing. We at the Flamborough Chamber of Commerce understand the importance to the local economy of horse racing and slots at Flamborough Downs. And we're very concerned that if those two things are ended at Flamborough Downs, that it's going to have a huge devastating impact on the local economy. So understand that we're working as hard as we can, both uh, in front of uh, the cameras and behind the scenes, to lobby for that. I want to finish with this thought. I'm a child of the 60s. I studied in the United States. I went to university during the 60s. It was the era of civil rights, of the Vietnam War, of the assassination of JFK and RFK and Martin Luther King. Today is Martin Luther King's birthday. And I came across this quote today and I want to share it with you in the hope that it will lead us to a constructive and positive decision. This is what Martin Luther King said. Rarely do we find men and women who willingly engage in hard, solid thinking. There is an almost universal quest for easy answers and half-baked solutions. Nothing pains people more than having to think. Let's all go home thinking about what we've heard tonight. Thank you. Good night.